11 30 p.m. in the Board of Education meeting room. Um, I will be brief tonight um, with my comments other than to say tonight we will adopt a Board of Education budget to move forward to the other town bodies. So um, thank you to the public who have followed us in this process. <coughs> thank you to the board for all their hard work going through this budget. And um, this is an exciting night to us. It feels like the end of the work for some of you. It is the beginning of the work for us. So join us on the journey to the Board of Finance and the RTM <laughs> as we move forward. And um, we look to uh, be excited to bring forward our budget at the end of this evening. With that, I will open it to public comment. Please, if you come up, remember to state your name and address. Don't be shy. I'm Amari Zerbe, and my address is 9 Morehouse Drive. I'm Maddie Park, and my address is 39 Park Place. So this is about um, an assistant coach for the cheerleading team. So this year, Coach Mack, which is our coach, has done a great job managing and taking care of the cheer team as it develops. Most of the girls have never cheered before, and we have developed many skills. Um, I personally walked onto the mat, and I was terrified of putting anyone up in the air. And now I beg Mac to stunt every day. I started off cheering, barely able to do a cartwheel, and now I'm working on cleaning up my back handspring. Um, Coach Mack is really good about making sure that what's put on the mat is the best that we can put on the mat, and despite this, there's still an, uh, a conflict with the wide range of skills within our group. There's a group within the team that is new to cheer and performing in general, and there's another group that has the potential to put more on the mat and develop advanced skills. This becomes hard because there is only so much one person can do to help both groups. We also don't want to exclude anyone from being able to cheer, but, and like we don't want to cut people from competition. So there's also been a struggle among a few girls feeling bad about themselves because they compare themselves to the more advanced girls who are doing much more than they are. The second coach could work with the novice group, and the coaching would be evenly divided among the team. As captains, we believe that if our team had a second coach who would be able to help Coach Mack managing the two groups, we would be able to... One, develop skills in both groups to our full potential. Two, showcase those more advanced skills. Three, aid Coach Mack in organizing performances, fundraisers, etc. And lastly, allow us to score higher um, and allow the cheer team to continue growing together as competition for FCX and upcoming as our states. Thank you. I'm Clara Sartori, and I'm here uh, because I am the chairman of RTM District 2. Clara, could you just state your address, please? Oh, 161 Old Kings Highway South. Um, I wanted to let you know that we met this evening um, with a quorum, and we had wanted to share a couple of our thoughts with you. We did have unanimous uh, consensus for these two thoughts. We have heard the concerns about the safety of the students in our district who are walking across Interstate 95 on their way to Darien High School. Particularly considering the construction projects in Neuroton Heights, we would like to see an immediate solution to the safety concerns. In addition, we request that the board do a comprehensive review of its transportation policy. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, I'm Pamela Kiernan, 1685 Boston Post Road, and I'm here once again on the wrestling mats. Um, we've moved the needle a lot, I feel, in the last week, and I want to say thank you to Dr. Adley and Commissioner Ackman and, uh, for coming out to support our team, uh, who 
very uh, coincidentally had a home match last week where we were hosting um, a top five in the state team. So I'm um, getting your eyeballs on the mats and seeing uh, what their status was <coughs> and um, where the potential was for improvement and uh, possible purchase really meant a lot to us and the team, who, by the way, appear to be recovering from uh, midterms. Um, but I'm here to, um, <laughs> but I'm here to, uh, uh, in their stead. Um, so, if if anyone has any questions, um, I'm here to assist. But I just wanted to thank you for all the support, and it means a lot to the team. Thanks. Pam, could you just give us your address again? Sorry. 1685 Boston Post Road. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Tara Worm, 17 Mystic Lane. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but just the last minute. I just had a comment about, it, we keep hearing over and over again, I wish about equity. And I, I think we have to stop using that word. Um, you know, we talk about equity with the sports, equity with activities. We might want to talk about what's fair, what's reasonable. Um, we can't have true equity. I mean put into tennis courts to have equity for the, unless we have equity, we're gonna have to put in ice hockey, pool, squash courts. We, we really can't have it. So I think we have to stop using that word and figure out what we think is fair, whether it's a number for sports and activities or you know per student, but it, the equity thing needs to kind of be squashed. <coughs> happy to get a pool though. If we wanna do it that way, <laughs> happy to get a pool. Is there any other public comment? Oh. Hi, my name is Patty Baumgartner. I'm at 64 Hanson Road. I'm um, on the RTM. I represent District 1, so not District 2 where this is affecting, but um, a number of people have approached me since last October about this to um, share their feelings, and so I've kind of done as much of a deep dive as I could on it. Um, and then I'm also on rules, so before I um, ever have to make decisions or give feedback, I like to do the due diligence. John stopped in at the District 2 meeting, so he's gonna hear my one minute of the same thing, sorry. Um, but I walked it on Saturday, and I do encourage all of you to walk it. I know some of you have, so I appreciate that. Um, I know. Over here, a few of y'all have walked it. Um, I know other ones are working and catching early trains, so they haven't done it yet. Um, but I did video and I did take some photographs, so I'm happy to share that with you. Um, it's dangerous, and I'm an adult and it's dangerous. And I left early Saturday morning, um, but not even as early as 6.45 in the morning, and it was still dangerous. <laughs> so I, um, I'm here to help with solutions and that's what I want to encourage you all to do. I've heard suggestions about crossing guards but after walking that and then going back and rewalking it um, we would need I think at least four crossing guards based on the areas that are high concern areas. Um, so I think by the time you do that the bus would be a solution for this specific area. I recognize that there's probably needs to be a broader overview of the transportation policy overall, and I've, I've read this, the state and local transportation policy, but I'm saying I firmly believe, um, and this is because I was on public works for a number of years, um, I know that there's three uh, DPW projects coming down the line, three big ones and they're going to be consecutive. So this is gonna be multiple years. So not only will the federal realty area affect it, because some of it does bump up against uh, Narotan Avenue, because they're doing a pocket park in that area. Um, but I think it's, I, my, my point is, um, not only are they crossing over 95 on ramps, on ramps, Hecker Avenue is a problem, Ledge Avenue is a problem, uh, Heights Avenue is a problem, even West is, is a concern. And so I strongly recommend, um, with all the construction projects coming on, that you please consider putting this into the budget for now. Thank you so much. Appreciate all y'all's hard work. Take care.
Good evening, Jenny Schwartz, 8 Saddle Ridge Road. I, um, I'm on the RTM District 1, and I also sit on Finance and Budget. I'm here uh, personally. I'll, Patty pretty much gave you the full recap of what, I, what I've come to know about the bus issue as well. Uh, I'll get right to the chase here. Um, I would be more concerned, I'm more concerned about the cost of not addressing this and leaving it as is, as opposed to uh, the cost of putting in, and I, I would fully support the Board of Ed uh, addressing it by putting it in the budget. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Mark Bevan. I live at 2 Concord Lane in Darien. I have two kids attending Henley and one at MMS. Like so many here in this room, I, uh, with my wife, chose to live in Darien not only for its many attributes, but intending for our children to go attend the town's renowned school system. As background, I grew up in Darien, attended schools here in town, and based upon my own experiences growing up here, I returned after getting married. I'm here tonight, like so many parents, I've only recently learned about the limited busing to and from DHS. Uh, with its two mile distance requirement and the precarious and potentially dangerous position that it puts so many students in who live south of 95 in particular. Uh, while my kids' future days at DHS may provide them with a bus route, I'm in disbelief that so many kids nearby us do not currently have that option. While I'm sure there are lots of reasons why the shortage of buses happened, what's most important right now is that this situation needs to be fixed. Why, why is it that kids who get bused to MMS are suddenly okay to walk to DHS when DHS for this district is further away? DHS starts earlier. Our parents who, work, uh, who both work obligated to have to drive their kids to school because that is the only safe option. Would you let your kid walk up Naroton Avenue only to have to sprint across Ledge Road intersection with I-95 on-ramp while it's still dark out early in the morning during winter months? All of you commuters and early morning drivers know how difficult it is to see pedestrians in the dark, and not to mention how many cars are speeding throughout these roads and intersections during those hours. Because most parents would rather not risk the safety of their children, I understand now why so many parents drive their kids to DHS every day. I know it's not cool to take the bus, but it's, is it any better to have so many kids having to get car rides to school each day either? Does it make more sense to add a few more buses or to have so many more cars making drop-offs and pickups after school? The town needs to step up now and to figure out how to get extra buses out there to solve this deficiency. A study should be done, but done for identifying the best ways to allocate buses, schedules, and routes effectively and efficiently and safely to, do, to address the needs of the students across town. For those students in the audience, I'm going to tell you that while, yes, we had more snow and fewer snow days when we all grew up here in town, but that, no, we did not, in fact, walk to and from school uphill both ways. <laughs> we should, as responsible parents, Board of Education members, and citizens of this town, not only uh, uh, not use the, sorry, should not use the way things have been done in the past as reasoning for justifying why things are less uh, than safe logical or how they should be now. I appreciate all your consideration to allevi alleviating this issue. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Any other public comment? We'll move on to the superintendent's report this evening, Dr. Adley. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. As you know, the, the, you may have heard the governor's recently released uh, proposed changes to the Biennium uh, budget modifications. Uh, so under those uh, released uh, from the governor's office, uh, educational cost sharing grant uh, to Darien basically stayed the same. It increased $15,000, but for the most part, it stayed the same at uh, 443000 um, A couple of things in, in the budget that you should note. Um, there was elimination of $4.6 million to two Stamford uh, charter schools that are closing. Uh, there's a reduction of 1.26 million in bilingual grants. Uh, the f they did fully fund the ECS, which is the Educational Cost Sharing Grant uh, uh, finances at the 2020-21 level. Uh, so they added 2.3 million. 
Uh, there are two uh, new additional staff members to the Connecticut State Department of Education. There was a reduction in a variety of programs, and if you hear them, you'll, you'll know what you'll, you'll resonate with you. Uh, after school programs, network programs, neighborhood youth centers, <coughs> and actually the American School for the Deaf. And they also limited a number of other, uh, what they consider low priority programs. Connecticut Writing Project, Parent Trust Fund, and Bridges uh, to Success, which is an early intervention program for uh, kindergarten readiness. I would also note that uh, to the board that we should keep an eye on uh, the, sco the school state finance project, which is really a co-op to fund special education. Uh, that is on the table again um, at the legislator. It is still vague, but I will say one of the criteria is that they're looking to adjust for ECS, um, access costs in particular I'm talking about here, is the town's ability to pay. So that sort of like, that sort of sets the scene a little bit. Uh, so we'll have to watch that uh, very, very carefully. I do want to recognize that uh, uh, this past Saturday we had 51 students from Darien High School, uh, the Authentic Science Program that competed at the Connecticut uh, STEM Fair at Joe Barlow. <coughs> 15 high schools and over 400 kids have uh, participated. And uh, uh, the students really outdid themselves and uh, really did the district proud in terms of uh, their recognition. When you hear some of these, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, Listen to these, some of these projects. Uh, so we had a number of students. Um, I'm not leaving kids out, but uh, I'm just naming the, the people who place one, two, and three in, in, the, uh, in the competition. Ethan Zhang. Uh, Ethan was minimally invasive pancreas to do denectomy versus open pancreas to do a denectomy in the current era. Is there a doctor in the house? I mean, <laughs> first place in physical science. Abby St. John, a retroactive analysis comparing three alternative uh, treatments for depression as opposed to the traditional antidepressant treatment, second place in behavioral science. Catherine Davenport, canines demonstrate a bias to commu communicative cues over non-communicative cues, third place in behavioral science. Uh, Andrew Lynn, the effect of colony size on social immunity in Ada tex Texana leaf cutting ants, third place behavioral science. Sebastian Mengel, on the possibility of combining multiple optical telescopes and very long baseline intertermology. Third place physical science. Schuyler Ford, single cell transcriptonomic interrogation of a genetic interaction. Still hard to say. <laughs> health and, uh, second place health and science. I mean, give those kids a, they're not here, but give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you to the members, there are people who are here and actually sitting around this table and others who are at home watching who participated last night in the uh, next strategic planning session. I thank you to our board members for participating. Dr. Lemons uh, uh, will come to the next board meeting and do an update to the board and solicit input from, the, from, from board members. So uh, that will be, I believe that's on the 20, 25th. Uh, thank you again to members of the community who came together. Um, for the NCCJ uh, work that we continue to do. This is our second meeting around issues of diversity and inclusion. Uh, it was a very proactive meeting, a uh, productive meeting, uh, where uh, the members of, of that committee actually got to the point of suggesting uh, natural next steps that we might be able to take as a community. Um, so I want to thank the town for partnering with the, uh, the school board on that, and uh, we look forward to that continuing. A uh, staff survey was sent out this week uh, to complete my entry plan, uh, which will be coming to the board soon. Uh, the first day in the district for Mr. Tramberg, the newest assistant superintendent, uh, will be March 30th. Um, we'll just be here a little bit earlier than, than expected. Uh, the Oxridge uh, uh, Security Committee meeting will meet uh, on Thursday morning, as well uh, later on that morning, the, the Design Committee. And it's a Valentine's Day, I don't know, it's Friday, uh, but that's also a day for us of uh, rich offerings uh, of professional development that uh, Dr. De Silva and her staff have put together. And let me just wish uh, our, our staff, our parents, and our students uh, safe and enjoyable and relaxing on winter break. Thank you. Great. We will move on to the approval of minutes. Um, it's requested that the board approve the following minutes. Minutes of the special meeting and executive session held January 28th, 2020. May I have a motion to approve, Mrs. Stein? And Mr. Um, Maroney, I'm sorry, Dennis. I was going to say Mr. Dennis. <laughs> All in favor? That's good. 
That is unanimous. Uh, minutes of the regular meeting held on January 28th, 2020. Mr. Brown and Mr. Burke, may I have a motion? Uh, all in favor? That is unanimous. Minutes of the special meeting held February 4th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. May I have a motion to approve? Mr. Burke and Mr. Deneen, all in favor? That is unanimous. And minutes of the special meeting held February 4th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Mr. Sini and Mr. Brown, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you, everybody. We'll move on to board committee reports. Mr. Deneen. Just in, in addition to what Alan said about Oxridge, we had a, a, our third um, design committee meeting. Uh, the project continues to move forward. Uh, there's another design committee meeting this Thursday after the security committee meeting. Following that, there were various meetings um, with the board, with certain members from the committee and the administration up at the school looking at, they've moved into the school is basically laid out in terms of the boxes in the classrooms. Now they're looking at what's going to go in those classrooms in terms of whether it's cabinetry, whether it's technology and stuff like that. Uh, there was a meeting with um, cafeteria and food specialists uh, last week also. We're also working through the enabling phase. That will be the phase where part of the original school will have to come down. Um, in order to start construction of the new school. Uh, the enabling phase we're hoping to start on or about June 17th, right after school ends. Um, there'll be a couple of sections of the school that have to come down. So the administration and the building committee are working through um, how that's gonna look in terms of what spaces in the school we're gonna use, where we're gonna need some portables, where we need some offsite parking. So there's a whole enabling phase project going on and it's, it's going very well. Um, Part of that is also getting that done. The state, at another meeting we had with the state, the state would like to see us include the cost for the enabling phase in the overall reimbursement from a grant standpoint. So we're working through that right now. Um, Katie Lubin's done a great job from an Oxridge community standpoint um, and other members of the Oxridge community. We have a tentative meeting scheduled for uh, March 5th to um, present the overall school to the Oxridge community, talk about where we are with the design, what the school looks like, and also kind of talk through the enabling stage and stuff that will concern the community in terms of construction. Um, we're working also on giving an update to the board on February 25th. We're trying to coordinate with the architects and the construction folks. They'll be here in town for a preliminary planning and zoning meeting. So then they're gonna come over to the board meeting to give us an update. And then we're looking to give an update to the RTM shortly thereafter in March. So. Overall, I think things continue to move um, at kind of a fast pace. The overall architects and the um, construction folks said they've never been more um, engaged or held to timelines and kept on target in terms of uh, building a school. So, and they've also commented us on the, you know, the people that are part of the committee too. We have architects, we have engineers, uh, we have construction folks. So it's really been a, a really good process and I think we're at a good place. Um, they had a preliminary meeting with EPC from an enabling stage, and uh, that is all fine. They're having a preliminary meeting with planning and zoning, and we're also prepping uh, for an architectural review board meeting also shortly. So a lot of things in motion, but we'll get a good update to the board on kind of the look, the feel of the school, the layout. Uh, then we'll roll that out to the Oxridge community and then to the RTM. Great. Thank you to you and KIPP. It's a great partnership between the schools and the town to get this done. Any other board committee reports? Seeing none, we will move on to presentations and discussions. Um, we will start with a presentation on discussion on the iPad strategic plan, Dr. De Silva and Dr. McGettigan. Good evening. Good evening, we have Dr. McGettigan here. I don't think mine is working, so I'm gonna have to use my big cafeteria. Oh, there it is, thank you. Good evening, I'm excited to have Dr. McGettigan here tonight alongside two of her students, uh, Toby and Sophie, who are sitting just uh, behind her. And I also see Jackie Bennett here and Jeff Adams in the back and some other folks from DHS. Um, Dr. McGettigan will share out some of the work that is happening at the high school with the iPad rollout and certainly the work that is, ex is expected to come in the future. So I thank Dr. McGettigan for all her hard work and off to you. All right, thank you, Dr. De Silva. Good evening. The students and I are delighted to speak to you tonight on the progress of the DHS 
iPad program. What we know is adding any device means nothing if teachers and students do not know how to use this technology in a purposeful and meaningful way. Tonight, we would like to discuss how we are moving toward the goal of transformational learning using iPads. First, we are going to briefly review the path that led to the one-to-one -one iPad program. Then we will discuss the changes that help <coughs> shape our iPad strategic plan. And finally, we will close with the most important voices in this program, our students. So why one-to-one -one and why iPad? You may remember back in 2015-16, after a great deal of research and debate, the one-to-one -one initiative was approved and the district committed to Chromebooks in younger years and iPads for the high school. We committed to iPads as a district because after two years of researching possible devices, we found that the iPad offered the most options, portability, creativity, and longer lasting power and the option of digital textbooks down the road. iPads enable learning experiences that are inquiry-based and rich in content and allow students to gain knowledge and create products they otherwise could not. Second, this program creates optimal teaching environments. A one-tool environment provides efficiencies of instructions, allows for mobility within the classroom, that is, our teachers are not locked to the front of the room. They can move all around the classroom with the iPad, put student work up on the board in a snap. Um, it really has produced very, very efficient uh, teaching practices. It also fosters greater creativity, the option of creating digital textbooks, downloading amazing free textbooks, and creating a fluid, easy, paperless environment. Finally, it is a question of equity and safety. In a one-to-one -one iPad world, we are not hampered by worrying about viruses, inequity, or barriers for transformative learning. During the planning for the one-to-one -one iPad rollout, a representative staff think tank curated a core set of apps. An initial iPad pilot began in the spring of 2017 with approximately 90 students and a small handful of teachers to assess the possibilities. This group looked for possible academic uses of the iPad, what apps would be appropriate, and what type of program would make sense. Some initial professional learning was offered to faculty at the high school at the end of the 2016-2017 year, and again at the beginning of the 2017-18 school year. The iPads were distributed to ninth grade in November 2017. The rollout to students took place during advisories where student-led sessions were aimed at getting students comfortable with the device. Full program, that is iPad with Logitech Crayon, has only begun in place since August 2019. The iPad program, since the start of November 2017, is only two and a half years old. The implementation is still in its early stages, Teachers continue to grow their capacity in using iPads as a teaching and learning tool. We have learned and made changes. The original case made sense economically, but it was challenging for students as it had a separate charger. They had to charge the case as well as the device. This academic year, we created a new launch for ninth grade iPad distribution. In the past, distribution was later in the year through advisory but tended to be held up by the necessary parent sign-offs in Aspen. This year, we invited parents to come in on orientation day with their children, receive any necessary help with Aspen sign-off procedures, and we also provided a lesson on the accessibility features of the iPad. We purchased a new keyboard case that's integrated that charges off the iPad, and we added the Logitech Crayon which we believe is a remarkable addition to the iPad. Students were able to hit the ground running when school started. We also added managed IDs just last month, which allows our students to collaborate across the iPad ecosystem 
and to download or publish books to the bookstore. A recent survey of faculty aligns with what we have seen anecdotally. Very heavy usage of iPads at ninth grade, less at 10th grade, and lower at 11th and 12th grades. We have seen faculty leverage technology to differentiate through QR-based stations, monitor student usage and distribute work easily through the Apple Classroom app, and be able to move freely around the classroom as they connect wirelessly with the projector. We've seen students take ownership of their learning in a variety of ways. Whether it is annotating text in rich and authentic ways and in multiple colors, making their learning visible with the Padlet app, creating annotated music sheets for choir and band, drawing and taking notes with the Notability app, creating voiceovers in world language, or using the Stop Motion app for time-lapsed capture of learning, or creating narratives in Book Creator app. In all, we've seen some truly interesting uses of the iPad, and the faculty that have been sort of at the forefront of this will be sharing these practices this Friday. So we're really excited that this is um, continuing to grow. Coming up in just three months is the Next Generation Science Standards Test. The old sets of Chromebooks that we have used at the high school in the past for testing are no longer supported by Google. Therefore, we will be taking these tests on the iPads. It is important for students to get comfortable, use their iPads on a daily basis so that when it comes time to taking uh, these high stakes tests, they're comfortable with the device. Our district goal, whether Chromebooks at younger years or iPads at the high school was and is to create and support a transformative and innovative learning environment, which fosters creativity and problem solving. Our strategy toward achieving this goal is to implement a framework of best practices with rigor and fidelity over the next three years. This framework of best practices is based on ISTE's essential learning conditions. ISTE, I-S-T-E, is the International Society of Technology Education. It is the foremost authority on technology education in the world. They have established 14 necessary learning conditions for a successful one-to-one -one program, including proper implementation planning, consistent and adequate funding, and equitable access. These 14 conditions we folded into five focused best practices. I'd like to touch briefly on the first best practice, visionary leadership. It is key to develop a shared strategic iPad vision and action plan with tactical targets. Ensure that the vision and plan is communicated broadly. Under shared leadership, we are halfway through our initial professional learning with department chairs and the entire high school admin team through the iPad teacher certification program. We want to lead by example, which is why we are starting off with the administrative team and department chairs. Under individual leadership, we have hired a director of instructional technology, me. And under community engagement, we have renewed our tech committee and brought our iTeam student leaders in to help with professional development and to explore and pilot new learning possibilities. <coughs> Our second best practice, innovative teaching and learning, has three critical elements. The first element is student learning, where personalized learning serves to engage. Our students are able to demonstrate learning in new and creative ways that help deepen learning, from choir and band to biology and Spanish. For example, from the creative genius of Lizzie and Courtney's book in Guy Pratt's biology class, I could grasp how Kodiak bears change color, and how that is influenced by environment, climate, and genetics. They use the Book Reader app to creatively, humorously, and succinctly instruct the reader in this process. 
They took ownership of their learning, making it more meaningful and deeper. And if anybody would like to see that eight-page book, I'll be happy to send it off. The second element in innovative teaching and learning is instructional practices, where faculty are master learners who expertly guide their students through difficult and complex tasks. In choir and band, students can annotate music right on their iPads, which has been extremely helpful. iPads allow teachers to not be locked in the front of the room. They can put more creative learning in place. In this case, you are seeing Mr. Herberger's class set up a creative learning experience for his students so that they could make meaning out of this scientific process, significantly deeper than memorizing the steps themselves. When students have opportunities like this to take ownership of their learning, it is transformative. The third element of innovative teaching and learning is curriculum design, where innovative and rigorous curriculum is redesigned to leverage technology. This is the continuum we want to move along from our current digitization of curriculum to a transformative level. The goal is to create learning experiences that are active, personal, collaborative, and relevant, designed to empower learners to be creators who believe their work matters. Our next uh, best practice is ongoing professional learning. For those of you who have read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, he advocates that the path to success is to leverage intense work with a small focused group to begin that tipping process toward innovative teaching and learning. We will choose roughly 10% of our faculty per year to become part of this intense working group, a vanguard group. This group will become iPad certified teachers to lead by example and help two colleagues reach that same status. They will work in a collaborative learning journal that will serve as an exemplar of digital teaching and learning at the high school. Each vanguard member will receive professional learning time as necessary. In addition to the vanguard groups, we will foster professional learning growth in a variety of modalities, including PD days, department meetings, Tuesday tech tips, one-to-one -one coaching, and setting PD expectations for administrators too, building expectations over time into our learning rounds and into our teacher evaluation tool, as well as department goals. Our second to less fast this practice is a compelling evidence of success. One of our challenges this year was to identify usage. But how do you define usage? Is usage stu students turning on the device, using it for rote practice? Or do we define usage as using our iPads to explore, discover, create, and transform our learning? We need to embed research practices into the life of the school. By analyzing, evaluating, and reflecting on collected data routinely, we can adjust the program where needed. What we know is that, again, the iPad usage is very heavy at ninth grade, somewhat strong in 10th grade, and drops off to lower usage in 11th and 12th grade, where our teachers have had the least amount of training and the least amount of time with students who have had these devices. Again, the iPad program has only been in place two and a half years. We believe that with these best practices in place and through consistent evaluation of data, we will continue to see growth toward the goal of consistent transformative learning. Our last but not least best practice is all about flexible learning environments. This practice covers two areas, building solid infrastructure to support demand, and second, creating learning spaces, both real and virtual, that are dynamic and agile. We've already begun rolling out these best practices and we will continue to evaluate, evolve, and build our program on the basis of continual innovation aimed at creating transformative learning environments. As with past presentations, I've invited two members of our I-team to share the program through their perspective. Now I'd like to introduce our two student speakers. 
Um, first, you're going to hear from Toby in 11th grade and then Sophie in 9th grade. Uh, hi, I'm Toby. I'm an 11th grader and a founding member of iTeam. Um, I want to, f um, there's a picture of me. Uh, I, I want to focus on the potential of iPads um, and a lot of the things the school has done to make improvements to the iPad program. So, um, I'm a big believer in the potential of iPads because actually, for a long time, it was my primary school device, um, even before the school's one to one program. Um, back then, iPads were a lot more limited, and we didn't have, and I didn't have the support of the school. Um, but it was still ideal for working with multimedia and infographics. And Apple's software were staples of all of my computerized work in middle school. So, how well does the school iPads work? For um, Google Docs, they work pretty well, and it's actually been a big area of improvement because the newest software update allows you to use the web-based version of the Google Docs, which many students are more familiar with. Um, so there we have a, a promotional picture from Apple of the web-based <laughs> Google Docs running. Um, and I've heard from many students that um, the web-based Google Docs has significantly improved their experience. But besides just Google Docs, the iPads provide additional ways to achieve the same functionality. So, with the new um, managed Apple ID, you can now take advantage of the Apple ecosystem, and that's the real strength of the iPads. So Apple's iWorks, which is their equivalent of Google Docs, um, is really strong for working with graphical media. Um, it allows you to integrate images um, very closely in with your text and design very graphically um, representative um, projects. Um, very easily and enables some stuff you could not do in Google Docs. Um, I would also like to mention that the iPads have cameras and many students take advantage of them to bring graphical representations from the physical world into the digital one. Um, for other apps outside of the core a Apple ecosystem apps, the school has provided us with a big range of creative apps that allow us to do handwritten work. Um, however, taking full advantage of those apps on the 11th and 12th grade iPads is difficult as they do not work with the Logitech Cran, which requires you to use your um, finger to draw, which is not very precise. The freshman iPads are the first iPads to have the Logitech Cran. And I have heard from many freshmen, and, and you will hear from a freshman soon, that the Cran has completely changed the way they use their iPads and opened up uh, new doors for creativity and practical applications. So, um, all in all, although there are some uh, limitations that still need to be overcome, the school has made significant progress into opening up the potential of the iPads with the Apple ID and the Logitech Cran. And um, Sophie, a freshman, will now come up and explain um, some of the ways the Logitech Cran has improved her iPad experience. Thank, Thank you, you, Toby. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Shu, and I'm a freshman here at the HS right now. So in the beginning, when they handed us iPads on the first day, I didn't think it was a very good idea because I was really used to Chromebooks. But now that I've used my iPads for a semester, I've really come to love them. And I honestly think that they're better than Chromebooks in so many ways. So first of all, like Toby said, the Logitech crayons are amazing. And they're probably the reason why I love my iPad so much. I can use them for a var variety of ways. I use them to be more creative or to re relax. I like to use it to study or just to organize my thoughts. Four of the apps that I like to introduce to my classmates are Notability, Autodesk Sketchbook, iBrainstorm, and Concepts. And they've allowed me to become more creative and also to do my schoolwork in many different ways. First of all is the teacher's favorite, which is Notability. This has been used in every single one of my classes so far, and it was introduced to me by my English teacher. As you can see on, my, on the home screen, I have a lot of documents on there, and I use it for every class pretty much every day. I like to use it to study the most, 
I tend to use in math and biology to rewrite my notes or redo problems, and it's become a really nice way to do things online, especially if I'm not at home or if I'm in a car. It makes life a lot easier. And for math, we do get physical paper packets in class, but it's always nice to do it again and again, and it's really helpful when I want to study things or if I get something wrong and I want to redo it. English class is where I first started using Notability, and what I tend to use it for is I would find PDFs and I annotate it online. I like it because it gives me a variety of colors and it's just easier to use than if I were to go out and buy 10 different highlighters and use 10 different colored pens. My favorite is definitely Autodesk Sketchbook because I'm probably more on the creative side. Ever since the first day of school, maybe even before, I started drawing using the iPads and Everything on there has been drawn by me. The one on the bottom left, I started on the first day of school, and I've been drawing on the iPads ever since. It's a really way, great way to relax, and it, sometimes when I'm bored in study hall, I just start a new art project. Um, I u also use it to study. It's interesting because I usually use Notability, but sometimes using, using Autodesk Sketchbook is actually easier to study, which is probably not what most people would use it for. I like to use it in when I have math tests or math quizzes, or the picture of the flower was used for my biology test when we had to label the parts of the flower reproductive system. And it was, it was just really helpful. All my classmates, honestly, they were drawing out the whole anatomy. I just had to fill it in. <laughs> These two apps are ones that I don't use very often, but my classmates love them, and so I thought that I should talk about them. The Concepts app and the iBrainstorm app are mostly used to organize your thoughts. The Concepts app is basically like a huge piece of paper that goes on infinitely. And you can constantly be writing more and making more connections. And it also has a very professional side of it. One of my friends is really, really into architecture and allows her to draw really precise diagrams. And I know that teachers tend to like to use it in woodworking and other classes like that. I'm not taking classes like that, so I'm not quite sure what other uses they may have. Um, for iBrainstorm, a lot of my friends who have trouble with technology use it a lot because it's really easy to navigate and there's so many different options for you to use it for. I think they even have some templates that have a basketball court or a hockey rink and I'm guessing coaches would like that a lot. Probably my favorite part of the iPad, and I know I said it was a Logitech crayons, but these two kind of go hand in hand. The iPad really allows me to do work on the go. And I know sometimes when I have to go somewhere, or I remember one time when I had to miss a lot of school, I was really stressed out thinking I couldn't get my work done. But because I had the iPads, I could get everything done on the car ride to where I was going. It lets me to, um, download everything that I need to do. And my textbooks are online, my homework I can download. And it just, if you're doing sports, or if you just, aren't going to have Wi-Fi for a while, it really helps you and you won't be so stressed out because you won't have to come back and do it in all in like two hours. I know a lot of people who do sports like it a lot because they have to have a lot of long bus rides and they come home really late and it's just helpful to, able to, to be able to do all their homework on the bus. Lastly, I wanted to introduce you the Achievers program. I'm one of the members of the Achievers program, and I rely on my iPad to do every aspect of my project. This year we started making podcasts, which is really new and interesting, and one of my friends even got offered to get sponsored on Spotify or something. It was pretty cool. <laughs> and without the iPad, I don't think I could do any part of my project except for maybe writing a script because I'm making educational videos and I'm relying on my iPad to draw, to make the movies, to edit, and basically without my iPad, I don't think I would have the idea project. I don't think I would have any part of my project complete. And that's all I have for you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Toby and Sophie. Um, we hope that tonight's presentation has shed light on the current status of the one-to-one -one implementation iPad program. And we hope that you will continue to support this young program as we grow toward that transformative learning environment 
that is our goal. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Are there any board comments or questions? Mr. Cini. Um, you, you mentioned in the presentation quarterly evaluation of evidence, and then the next bullet, keep the Board of Education Community apprised of the status. Yes. Can you go into a little bit more detail on that? Sure. Uh, we'll be collecting quantitative and qualitative data. Um, we can present that to you however you would like, whether you would like it in one of the many infamous creative apps that Sophie mentioned, um, or we can give a, a straight out presentation. Um, but we think it's important, that goes back to that shared uh, leadership, it's really important to keep um, your community apprised of things that are changing, evolving, successes, and failures too, and how we address them. Um, so we, we feel that that may not have been done to the degree that we would like to start doing. I mean, just a quick follow-up, if I may. Sure. Um, from a professor learning standpoint, also how, you're, how do you evaluate that? John, can you just speak into the mic? They can't catch you. Um, how, do you how do you measure it? How do you, how do you evaluate it? What's the plan going forward in terms of professional development? It's tough to... Yeah, I know. We okay. <laughs> so, it's um, measuring professional learning growth that we put in place. Um, so there's lots of different ways to deliver that professional learning growth, which is um, one of the things that I mentioned. So professional development days, you just you can't have enough, right? One-to-one um, -one coaching, having that vanguard group begin will be an essential key to that. Uh, but how you measure it has to be as many modalities as you're delivering uh, that professional learning. So we would like to build it into the learning rounds that all of our department chairs do. So when they're looking for different aspects of their particular department, we would like to also include what should you be looking for for professional growth in using these, this piece of technology. Uh, we would like to build it into the department goals, into the building goal um, for Darien High School, as well as putting it into our teacher evaluation tool. Um, in addition to that, we also, of course, are going to be doing surveys of faculty as well as students. So using all of those different lenses to look through, uh, we're hoping that we're going to have a good idea of just what kind of progress we're making. No. Mrs. Stein. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll do one that follows up on, John, on Mr. Cini's point about um, sort of have you looked at the capacity of the staff at DHS now? Some are probably more comfortable with technology, some less so. How do you factor that into the Vanguard groups? Is it self-selected? Um, you know, I'm terrified of technology, so I probably wouldn't be raising my hand. How are you going to get those people to sort of buy in and, and you know, learn? Well, I, I can be quite charming and persuasive, but <laughs> setting that aside, yeah. um, choosing the members of the Vanguard group is actually pretty important. So you do not want to, as you might expect, um, faculty are a law on a continuum. Some are beginners, some are getting comfortable with different aspects, and some are just like rockets going off into space. Um, I have to run to keep up with them. So in a Vanguard group, you want to have a balance of those individuals, and you also are looking for teachers who are influencers. Who are people that other teachers look to? This is something Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about in his tipping point, um, is making sure that when you're making these selections, you're doing it in a very careful and thoughtful process. Because you don't want to, it's easy to take the, the top uh, techie teachers, you know, but what you really want to do is you want to advance the entire continuum. So having a balanced approach to that, and making sure that you are um, supporting all those individuals where they are. Mr. Brown. So I'm sorry, I just had a couple of questions. <clears throat> Clarify a couple of points, I apologize. You talked about barriers to transformative learning. Yes. I don't know, I'm not familiar with that. If you tell me what that means to you. Uh, there's lots of different barriers that are, are put in place. Um, and so for example, I've been in uh, districts and schools that have had a BYOD uh, program. So imagine, if you would, Mr. Brown, that you are one of the top chefs 
because Darianne hires nothing but the best, right? And you have been asked to travel from house to house with this four course meal that you are going to prepare. So it includes French onion soup, a lovely salad, going all the way to dessert. The first house that you arrive at, you have all your knives, your necessary tools, you have all your ingredients, but all they have are paper plates. So how are you going to serve your soup, okay? The next house, the next night, perhaps they only have a wok that you can cook in and you have to adjust again. This is the kind of experience that a teacher goes through trying to plan those really high level instructional practices when you cannot count on what tools you're going to have in the classroom. It makes it extremely difficult. And so what usually happens in those environments is that teachers start teaching to the lowest common denominator. And that's really a loss. It's not a, a transformative learning environment. Follow-up? I, I now have a follow-up, I'm sorry. I had two others, but now quick follow-up. Um, so I get your analogy there with the kitchen and the paper plates. Um, some of the technology we've talked about, like the Logitech CRAN or Google Docs or uh, Autodesk, those will only run on an iPad? Um, the Logitech CRAN only works with an iPad. Okay. I can't tell you what will happen in three years' time because technology changes so rapidly. But I'll, I'll give you two points um, why I think that this is, is so key. And please know if you walked into my home office you would see a Microsoft Surface tablet, uh, an Asus computer, uh, a really, really old iMac, because I just think it's beautiful. I'm an equal opportunity offender um, in technology, so I'm always looking at what is going to be the best tool for us. So when you are looking at how do students best take in information, and let's get a simple task, taking notes, okay? So in a study that was, um, by Pam Mueller at Princeton and I have it written down here, Daniel Oppenheimer at University of California. Uh, this is probably the most often quoted study about this. When people type their notes, they have a tendency, as you might expect, to take verbatim notes, right? This is why at so many colleges and universities, professors are actually outlawing laptops. They don't like hearing the clickety-clack, and they know that by taking verbatim notes, that's a non-generative form of note-taking. You are not synthesizing the material at all. So when you're using that Logitech crayon, and you are taking all these different kinds of notes, and as you can see from Sophie's uh, screen, she uses it in every class, right? So it takes her handwritten notes, it can convert it into text, that is searchable um, and allows her even to throw Audible in there as well. But it's a much more meaningful way of taking that information in um, and it, it's much deeper learning. So that's just one tiny aspect of why I think the Logitech Crayon is um, truly an amazing tool. So I had a couple more. I'll try and rephrase um, this yes or no. And jump around a little bit and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Brown. Okay. Mrs. Stein, so I'm, I'm going to jump off here. So can you just clarify <coughs> the Logitech crayons ninth, grade, ninth graders have them? Yes. Will the current 10th graders, do their iPads have the capacity to use Logitech crayons? They do have the capacity. I just didn't have the money for it. Okay. Um, I guess looking at what the ninth grade, ninth grade iPads do versus what the 11th grade iPads do or 12th grade, it's, you know, it's a vast difference. And you see, we've discussed it, um, the bring your own device is happening a lot in those upper grades, I think, anecdotally. You'll see when you, but um, I am concerned that the ninth graders are getting an experience that is probably, I think it's significantly better than what those other iPads are um, performing at. So I think that's a conversation to be had. Um, you know, for, I, I, it troubles me. I'm just gonna say that. It, you know, I think it's amazing, but I, it also scares me that, you know, it's the current junior class. So two and a half years ago, the iPads could do everything, and we're looking at two and a half years, not a full rollout, and already they're almost 
obsolete isn't the right word, but they can't do everything the kids need to do. So I, that's a conversation I'd like to have at a later date, but to me, why, why aren't we getting Logitech grants for the 10th graders? Sorry. Trusting Mrs. Stein, if I could, I'd be at the corner with the cup collecting uh, you know, change at right. the ready. And it for doesn't them. work for the 11th and 12th graders, correct? You can use um, a stylus, you can use a, a Donut Joe. Um, there's a couple of different other stylus that, that will work with it. Um, one of my daughters has an iPad that is about four years old now, and she's a studio art major. Oh, think, um, yeah. So she has a couple of different higher end um, stylus tools that she uses. And so she still has a, a great experience on it. And I think so, if that's going to bring us to the point where kids are using them and they're working in the classroom, we won't have as many kids probably bringing their own device. So Dr. McGavian, maybe when we get a full yeah, tech sorry. update, because I mean, part of this is technology that's cyclical. That technology was not available right. at the time. So maybe as a full tech plan, when that rolls out, we can see how are we going to work in budget around keeping up with technolo technological changes. Um, because, you know, the Commodore PET that I learned on, it was really not, all, it was amazing. For, Still a fine know, tool. It's great. But I mean, I think part of this is going to be cyclical. So yeah. maybe as we lay out this plan, you can talk to um, how, how we are going to react and adjust to new technology as it goes forward. Mrs. Ritchie. Um, so I wanted to touch on something in your presentation, which is the 11th and 12th graders really aren't utilizing their technology. And it might be that they have the older versions and they just can't use and do as many things. So is there a way, I guess the 12th graders are graduating, so we don't need to be concerned about them. But is there a way to engage those 11th graders and get them to use their technology sure. more? And so, how do we do that? You know, uh, part of that issue is um, connected to two factors. So one, if you're a 12th grade teacher, this is the first year that you have had students with those devices. So if you are sort of at that early stage where you are fearful of technology, you can imagine um, trying to work this into your program is a little bit more difficult. Second, the professional learning that we had in the past was sort of geared all at one level, you know, blast out. Uh, what we have done is we've evolved this professional learning to a much more practical based. Uh, so for example, this Friday will be mostly department based learning that will actually be, this is a little example, we're going to facilitate, we're going to walk you through creating these different lessons using one or two of these apps and we're going to be ready to go right after break. And that's another way that you start that tipping process. Um, but it really has to be sort of at all of those different levels that I spoke to. Mr. Brown. Sorry, I, I'm just trying to finish up. And I, you know, we have to vote on this tonight. It's an item, so I'm trying to get a little more information. Shoot, Mr. Brown. No, full, it's not. Full plan later. Um, you talked about 10% was going through training? Yes. So it'll be a decade until everyone gets through? No. Um, you know. Malcolm Gladwell will tell you that it really doesn't, okay, I'm just going back to that because it, it okay. takes. I just asked you, not Malcolm. I'm okay, Let, let's, <laughs> let's. What like, I'm, I'm trying to say guys. to you, Mr. Brown, is that if you are looking at that Vanguard process where I've had great success with in the past, it takes three to four years. You don't need the entire faculty to go through that process because the entire point of the Vanguard process is that each year that 10% is expanding out into the faculty, that knowledge and that experience. And Any other? The last question was you talked about measuring usage. I think you had three different buckets in terms of powering on, whether it was, I think I heard rote learning or whether it was creative learning. What, what metrics do you have for usage at this point? Could you elaborate a little bit? on how you can keep track? Those are the metrics uh, that I spoke about before. So trying to um, build that into the teacher evaluation mode, into learning rounds, into different survey work, um, into showcases at department meetings, into one-to-one -one coaching. This is where you start to pick up on what is happening in the classrooms. You just got a, a sense that just from an 11th grader and a 9th grader 
of how that use um, is at those two different levels. So I guess, but there were three different, I thought I heard powering on, can you measure if it's just powered on? Like, can we tell how many hours a day each device is used or in service? Is that something we know? You know, Mr. Adams, is he right still? Behind, yeah. Okay. I'll turn that over to Mr. Adams to answer. Just turning the device off. Sure. Unfortunately, there is not a tool that tells us that. These are, these started off as personal devices, Apple has made them a perfect device, but there is no tool out there that we know of that, that can tell you when it's going to come on or how much the software is, is used on. Thank yeah. you. Mrs. McCann. Um, thank you for the presentation for the, um, I appreciate the frameworks that you put around the thinking. It's, it's much easier to see. I also appreciate your um, clarity about what is and isn't working and I hope we can continue to converse in that vein because that is the reality of technology and we're yes. certainly all familiar with that. Um, I, a little bit uh, piggybacking off of, of Mr. Brown's question about measurement, I think one of the exciting things that we saw in person and we heard about in the presentation is the different ways that students use it and you have talked about um, different ways of, of kind of measuring success but can you talk about how you gather flexibility and individuality, and at the same time, success. How do you measure those two things? There's not going to be one common definition of success. I succeeded because um, everybody used this one app in the same way, which we're used to, you know, we're more used to that. Everybody took a test, and therefore I know it succeeded. Everybody read seven chapters in the same textbook, so I know that that's a working tool. In this environment, our ways of thinking and feeling are, 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 and operating are different. So. Again, I know you gave some examples, but can you talk about that from a more philosophical? Sure, from a, a philosophical standpoint. Um, so you saw some examples of that. You saw in the science classroom how they were using a stop motion app mm -hmm. uh, to capture the process mm -hmm. of that learning and how that ownership of that learning makes much deeper meaning for those students and therefore makes them understand the process greater. So. You know, we have um, students across the country who are very, very good at the game of school um, and skilled at memorizing. <clears throat> but if you look at the World Economic Forum that just recently published the top 10 job skills, um, you have really interesting changes. Uh, creativity, for example, that it was a recent addition at the bottom of the list, jumped to number three. Measuring creativity is extremely difficult. Um, professors at Stanford are still trying to figure that out. Um, how do you actually capture that and how do you uh, know if you're successful in increasing the amount of creativity that your students are demonstrating, the amount of creativity that your faculty are trying to engender in the classrooms. So I don't have a a flat out answer for you. I wish I did. Um, I wish I had a sort of an easy big brother um, kind of answer that would take all of the data in uh, that the students are doing and, and give me sort of an answer back. You know, we can do simple things. We can tell you what the usage is of different software. But that doesn't tell you what the student is doing with the software. Um, even if we could track when a device is on and off, it doesn't tell you what the student is doing with that time. I have twins, and I can tell you that one twin will be watching three hours of YouTube videos, and it's on makeup and all sorts of things, and I'm sure that it's fascinating to her. Um, her twin will be watching How Do I Build a Bookshelf, and then telling me I need some money to go to Home Depot which is kind of terrifying in and of itself. <laughs> so, you know, it's, again, it goes to what is the quality versus the quantity. You know, what we're really focused on is the learning. What can we do to move the needle on the learning? That's what our focus is. Any other board comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. McGettigan. We, as a thank reminder, you, we welcomed you in thank July, you, and you. I think yes. since then we have seen a real push and movement forward around technology. So in a very short time, you've done some really amazing work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joan. Thank you for your leadership, Joan. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we will move forward on further discussion and possible action of the new courses for the Darien High School for the 2020-2021 school year. Dr. De Silva and Mrs. Dunn. As a reminder to the board, we heard a description of these courses um, last meeting. We'll vote to approve tonight. Yeah, we can do it then, Bob. And help your hands, unless someone. Are there additional questions? Are we, I mean, I didn't know, I saw Mrs. Dunn coming up. Are there additional questions from the board? Is the board comfortable taking the approval of these courses as a block, or do you want them separated out? No. Comfortable as a block? Okay. okay. So with that, can I entertain a motion to approve the new courses as described for the 2020-21 school year? Mrs. Stein so moves, Mr. Maroney seconds, all in favor, and that is unanimous. Thank you, love quick items. Um, and we will move on to what I think many are here for this evening, a further discussion, approval, and any questions regarding the 2021 proposed Board of Education budget. Um, as a reminder of how we will do this, and please bear with us because it's a little tedious. Um, we will go down the ad cut list, RC by RC. I will motion all ads and cuts that have been noticed at this point. If there is no second to the motion, we will move on. If there is a second to the motion, conversation can ensue and we will go from there um, and if necessary, call for a vote. Any questions on how we're going to proceed? Once we have a second, if there are questions, please feel free to just, um, direct them to the administration. Um, just remember, no second, and we move on. Can I just add yep. to that? If someone has something new that we haven't discussed, then can you please make sure that you give the account numbers, the RC account number, and the specific item yeah. that you're moving with the dollar amount, please? Ideally, we keep it to this list, but if there is something, <laughs> bear with us. <laughs> All right, so I will begin with RC number one, um, Darien High School, object code 21306, teachers are gifted a proposed change to the budget of a cut of $15,859. May I have a motion? Uh, I will move, is there a second? Seeing none, we will move on, motion, and nothing carries. Um, RC one DHS, Substitutes, uh, that is 21302. Um, the board, I will make a motion to move. If someone wants to second, we can also then take them as a group. You can modify my motion. Got it. Everyone understand this was actually put up as a $50,000 cut. The administration portioned it out. So there's a proposed change to the budget at DHS for $8,500. Is there a second? Mr. Maroney. Um, discussion. Mr. Deneen? I think based on the last meeting, the administration brought up some concern about the size of the cut, $50,000. While you left the budget flat year over year, I still think it's something that really has to be focused on. I know, Marge, you've said it's something that you have a lot of discussions with the teachers and the union reps on, um, but I think it's something that really has to be focused on. My original recommendation was $50,000. If you, I'd love to hear what the administration says if you think it needs to be less, but there's a commitment there to continue to monitor this. Um, I'm open to listening to that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I think we're also including our, just for visual purposes, one through 10 and 24, which is special education substitute teachers also as part of the 50,000 just for clarification, although we're not down there, just that. Um, I think that I think the administration ideally would like to not make any reduction here uh, based on currently high school, middle school, <coughs> and special education um, are trending a little bit lower. Uh, but as you saw in, the, in the, that diagram that Rick did for us, it spikes in the summer. Um, if we had to make a cut, uh, the most I would say is about 20,000. $20,000. Um, don't forget we've got the, the fourth per, uh, personal day. Um, so ideally I, I would say nothing, um, but I certainly wouldn't recommend anything over 
uh, twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Any other? Because there's a motion on the table, unless someone wants to make a new motion to amend. The twenty thousand, just by the way, just in case you where where to come from. We did an analysis of the number of, of personal days that people take, like three fourths of the four, and so that, that's kind of where it came from. Okay. Do I see a hand, S Mrs. So Ritchie? Just, just for clarification, that twenty thousand dollars would that include special ed, or is that across the other RCs? It would include it would include special it would include special education. <laughs> So is there, yeah, I don't Can I, Mrs. McCann? I just wanted to make sure I understood what you said, please, Dr. Adley. That the, the twenty thousand dollars comes from the impact of the fourth personal day in the contract and how that means that other people that people aren't now taking these portions of days the way they were before. Is it's just an correct? it's just an analysis of the number of days that, that we see people taken. And just with the additional fourth day, it's just calculated like that. I honestly would prefer prefer we don't touch this at all, to be honest with you. I mean, that's my. But so I guess you bring up an interesting point. So within this budget are substitutes that we need when someone takes a PTO day. Correct. Versus these are just not substitutes for sick days. Correct. But you have that data in terms of the amount of sick days that we have to hire substitutes for. But I think that needs to be, in some ways, that needs to be broken out. I'm okay paying for a substitute for someone that's taken a PTO day as part of their employment. But what I'm concerned about is the cost of the amount of sick days. So I, I, I don't know, Mrs. McCammon, if you got an answer. I think what you're saying is it causal. Is the fourth day causal for the change? No, not, not completely, not entirely by itself, no. Absolutely okay. not. I just mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. So the motion on the table at the moment is a fifty thousand dollar cut, unless there is an amendment or a new motion. Okay. Mr. Burke. Based on Dr. Adley's statement, I, I would move to amend the cut to twenty thousand. Okay. So then I would need a second on moving to amend. Mrs. Stein, all in favor on the amendment? That is. Carries one, two, three, four, five. Do you have the Duke, me, you? Now, discussion on the $20,000 change. I, I, I just feel it's, we need to make sure we have the right data, all right? I think paying for substitutes for PTO days is one thing, and having an absentee issue is another. And I'd like to see the costs associated with an absentee issue. So that's where I'm getting at. I mean, as a whole, this is $300,000. And we don't seem to be chipping away at it or making progress on it, so. So can I just, can I just ask, so PTO, I know that's a corporate term, that's pers personal and sick? Personal day off, vacation day off. Right, so there's no vacation days in there. There's so no vacation days no, in there. No, because we, the 12 month employees get vacation days and we don't get substitutes for- But they for, have personal days to take they off. They do, but again, the, it's only the cost of the sub that's in there. So paraprofessionals and teachers are what you see in the substitute line and you see not their professional days that they use for professional development, but just the sick and personal. They're in there. Okay, so there is a motion to amend the budget with a $20,000 cut across substitute lines. We can take it like that for you, and then the administration can break it out. Okay. So, is there, Mrs. McCammon, you look like you want to say something before I, I call for I a vote. I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I, ultimately, this budget aside, I'd like to back up Duke's point that I think this is an area where we can start to build some more clarity in, in the data and what it looks like and what the drivers of it. Um, ultimately, this vote is separate, but I, I think Duke's point is important. Okay, so. So you need a motion to approve. A, mo a motion. motion to approve a $20,000 cut across substitute lines in the superintendent's proposed budget. Mr. Burke, so moves. Mr. Maroney seconds, all in favor. That it carries with Stein. Burke, Richie, and Deneen all opposed. Mr. Sini, Mrs. McCammon, Dave, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your vote today. He's abstaining. Jesus. Oh, and any abstain, anyone abstaining? Mr. Brown. Mr. Dennis. Dennis was in favor. In favor. In favor? All right, so the motion carries. So just McCammon, Sini, against? Yeah, uh, yes. 
And Mr. Brown abstained. Be before you move on, can we put it up on the screen or? Um, I see the do you have it to put it up on the screen? The spreadsheet? Yeah. But it, um, well, I think the yeah. Do you have it? Yeah, John? I do. So yeah. it's a little small. Track it as you're going. It's okay. It's a little small. In my mind, I was <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so we total it at the end and in the middle, well. <laughs> not as we go. We will, we'll call, like about halfway through, we stop and we see where we are. Okay. Okay. Um, we will move on to PE Athletics uh, 10201. Um, there's an addition to the budget of $89,840. I'll move anyone, second, Mrs. Stein. Any discussion? Mrs. McCammon. Um, this is an overall comment. It applies to more than just this line item, but in the current environment, um, where we are looking at, we've looked hard at how to cut the budget, and we've looked hard at, um, you know, we've looked hard at, at some efficiencies, particularly with staff, and had to cut people, um, where we were holding off on some educational programming. I just truly struggle to add to the athletics budget, and I, I am so excited for kids to have what they need to have. I just, in this current environment, uh, struggle to add to this category of line items. Okay, the 89,000 is uniforms is, and, okay, just making sure. Any other comments on this? All right, there's a motion on the table. All in favor of the add of $89,840,000 to the budget. That is Mrs. Stein, Mr. Burke, Mrs. Deneen. I'm sorry. Mrs. Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. Ackman. Mr. Deneen. Mrs. Reggie Wonder. Nasty text. All all opposed. Mr. Sini, Mrs. McCammon, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Baroni. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Um, we will go on to PE Athletics line 10201 in ad of eighteen thousand six hundred dollars. I will move. Is there a second? Mr. Burke seconds. Is there any conversation on this item? Mr. Burke. Uh, I just wanted to be you know, clear. I, I feel like I'm in favor of this ad, but I, I think it's, I feel that they ought to have those mats. I believe the administration, when they say that those mats are safe, and I don't, and I want to be clear that I don't dispute what the administration's representations are concerning the safety uh, issues. I think they are, uh, you know, they are the ones that are there. They have the responsibility for making sure these items are safe. And so when they say that they are, I believe that they are, unless I have a compelling reason not to. That said, I think with everything else that goes on in athletics, I think I believe that they've made, uh, the wrestlers have made a, an effective case as why that uh, item should be added. Okay. Any other conversation on this item, Mr. Sini? Can I ask what the, what that is? I mean, because I I heard the way I heard it, and listen, uh, you can envision me in a onesie back in the day, but I did wrestle. Um, <laughs> Rather not. <laughs> um, but I heard, I heard safety is the number one reason why, and uh, you know I, I think the administration came back about two or three times on that issue. Um, so. Uh, I'm in full support of athletics in this town, but again, in the grand scheme of things, if we can squeeze out another uh, two or three years, I'm not sure what the replacement cycle is. I think that's a bigger discussion that this board needs to have. I would support that at a later date. Mrs. Stein. Would, would the board have an appetite for potentially putting one in, which was the administration's original rec recommendation, with the thought that next year we would see the second one come in? Put that out. Can well, we just clarify that? Actually, there was none in the in your no, recommendation. No, well, it was. I'm sorry. Not in the recommendation, but in our list of things that were going to be put forward. But Correct. So and it was on the table at one point, not on our table. No, no coach or athletic director asked for the two though, at yeah. any point during the process. So, uh, Mrs. McKenna. <clears throat> um, I feel similarly. Uh, because again, in the current environment, I'm having trouble adding to this category of, of the school system. Um, I do strongly feel that we need an equipment replacement cycle so that we can see when these things are coming up and we can see um, what's happening. 
Um, so I think, you know, rather than hear that this is something out in the ether, I'd really like to see us taking a structured approach to needing to re replace equipment. Mr. Brown. Following up on Mr. Burke and Ms. McCannon, um, I think that, you know, again, I'm very comfortable to rely on the representations of the administration as to the safety um, in terms of this or other items. Um, also, I think that we should look in terms of what the schedule is, what policies we have in place, look at athletics generally, what the framework is there uh, with the administration, and have this perhaps on the agenda at some time for a comprehensive review, because it seems to me uh, athletics comes up again and again in different ways, shapes, and forms. But so we see athletics a lot, and I think perhaps that's something the board should think about tackling in, in one effort. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. McCann. I was going to add to my point about the equipment replacement cycle. Um, if we see it coming up in a, in a replacement cycle and there's a decision by the community that they want that faster, then there's an opportunity to have a conversation. But I think that the school system should follow safety and should follow whatever is recommended and that that should be reflected in a cycle. So I will say it's interesting we have a uniform cycle, right, and, and I think that that was a good introduction, and then we talk about deferring it or not, and so if we have an equipment cycle, those, I think it's probably wise to have an equipment cycle that we can find. Um, I would agree that I think um, I'm not concerned that we're not meeting minimum safety requirements. Um, I do think that the question is, is that the standard applied across sports? Or are we looking that we have five stars over here and three stars over here and we have bare minimum over here? And so where I think the wrestlers have made a compelling case is that we um, are safe, but we probably could be better. And um, I, I'd be willing to entertain, but I think I would be, we can have a discussion of whether it's one or two, but I think at this point, um, to ask this team to wait longer. I haven't seen a compelling case of why we need to wait longer for <coughs> at least one match. Anyone else? So should we make a motion well, for the Well, if that? someone can make a motion to modify if they'd like, or we can vote the motion on the tables for 18,600, which I believe represents two mats. I will make a motion to amend it to 9-3. Is that what mat is? 9,300. 9, a vote to approve I'll, that. I'll Mr. Cini will second that motion. All in favor of that amendment is unanimous. This is where your notes get tedious. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Any discussion on that? If not, we can vote on that yeah, motion. That Mr. Maroney. Does that allow? So, I guess my question goes to wrestling: Is why do they have two mats, and can is one mat sufficient, or is I mean? Well, I guess we think, we think both are safe, so therefore one mat is just a newer mat, correct? Yes. So yeah, that's that, all that, that changes. This will accompany the 15-year mat. Yep. No, so they need two mats when they when they host the, their meets. So there are two mats that are required. There's one that is older than the other. So the one, I think, the 9300 would be to replace the older of the two mats, the one that's in worse shape. So the motion on the table is to modify the budget uh, add to $9,300. All in favor? Mrs. Stein, Mr. Burke, Mrs. Ritchie, Mrs. Offman, and Mr. Deneen. All opposed? Mr. Sini, Mrs. McCammon, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Maroney. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Um, we will move forward on to uh, interscholastic stipends. I'd like to take them as a group if possible. Um, but if there's any board member that wants to separate them out, please let me know. Um, it's line 101002. There is a proposal on the table to cut the stipends of $4,517. May I have a second? Mrs. McCammon. Is there any discussion on the issue? Are we, I'm sorry, are we taking them together or are we taking them separate? Are we doing them? Um, did anyone have a, did anyone, were we, I believe Ms. McCammon, it was your modification, so I'm just going to ask, were you looking at the whole thing or were you looking at separating out specific coaching stipends? I was looking at the whole thing. Okay, so at the moment we can take them as the whole. If anyone feels strongly, we can. I have a comment. 
Are we, are sure. we talking? Yep, We're not yep. Talking yet. Okay. Um, I guess my concern with cutting these is with our sports, historically, we've given coaches the purview of cut, no cut, and we're sort of making that decision for those sports without the coaches having a say. We're, I think we're going at it backward, right? And that's another conversation to have when we have the athletic conversation, cut, no cut, but I don't feel like I'm in a position to say to those sports, you're gonna have to cut kids because we're not gonna give you the coaches you need for the a number of kids you wanna have in your program. Any other conversation? Mrs. McCammon. I respect the point. I just want to be clear, I'm going to be voting consistently on this particular category of line items. Okay. Can I clarify that category of line items just so we're all clear? Yeah. It was not a mandate from this board to reduce staff, correct? So we found the way you presented it to us, Dr. Adley, yeah. was it, you found efficiencies. The way Mrs. McCammon is discussing it, I just want to be clear, there's a difference in my opinion. Um, the environment we're in. So if it's you found efficiencies and it happened to be with staff, that's one thing. But I think when we're framing some of these decisions, I, you know, I think my perspective is different from Mrs. McCammon's and probably different from everyone's around the table. Sorry. Um, Mr. Murata. I do have a question on the, the four, taking these four together. So I think in public comment tonight, the cheerleaders raised an interesting point and one I was not aware is that one coach cannot sufficiently have a safe practice with differing degrees of abilities at a cheerleading practice. I'm not sure the same applies to swimming and soccer. So my question is, to Mrs. Stein's point, are the swimming and the soccer to, pro to allow full participation and cheerleading is for safety, or are they all for the same rationale? I don't know if they're both mutually exclusive, those concepts. Uh, if you've got more kids, you're going to need more, more supervision for the safety reason. But simultaneously, you're opening up the doors for more kids to play. So um, I just don't see them so separate, that, okay. to be honest with you. I think I, the, I, the oh, challenge sorry, is, I think you made more of a case from a safety standpoint, as did students and parents, than the athletic director. I think the athletic director's presentation had me thoroughly confused because to me, the numbers in terms of number of athletes and coaches made no sense and there really wasn't any clarity around that as to what standard we're using and how do we compare to other DIRGs and stuff like that. So I'm all for it from a safety and security standpoint, but I think, you know, Katie and Dennis bring up a good point and, you know, it's all about how do the numbers work. I couldn't make the numbers work as to why some sports seem to have a lot more coaches and fewer students, and there was really no explanation around it, hence the conversation we need to have around athletics. But it just, it wasn't presented in a compelling way to me. Rich made more of a compelling point about adding an accountant to his staff. Um, I would say that I support, excuse me, everybody. I would support Mrs. Stein's point. Um, I think it's difficult when we have some teams that aren't cutting because it was, uh, a, to coin a phrase I'm not sure I agree with, a better environment versus other years where you can't. I think probably then as a board or, an, or a school, to Mr. Deneen's point, we need a theory other than the, the coach decides because there's a budgetary implication. So we can either have the board dragged into that or the high school can come forward and really give us their philosophy on how they want to do it but it's really difficult having this hybrid and then telling some teams you know you can't we're here to make difficult decisions so i appreciate how everyone feels they need to vote on this um but i, I think that's a compelling point to be made okay. can i just say from a record like i mean very very respectfully Duke, I, I just don't agree with your assessment of the athletic director's presentation <laughs> i mean i just want to say that because i I, I'll just respectfully disagree at this point. Okay, so, oh, Mr. Sini? And, and, and I think this, you know, underscores, and we brought it up many a time, the need to have a comprehensive discussion around athletics. Okay, um, I'm going to vote in line, well, vote for, in line with the <coughs> superintendent's recommendation on this, this item. But I feel like we're making ad hoc decisions as a, as a board along each line item. And so that's all, I'll leave it at that. 
Okay. Um, so at the moment we have it as a um, the motion is on the table to cut um, line one zero one zero zero two the athletic stipends as you all see there. Anyone want to actually total that for me, Mr. Rudolph, and tell me what it's the fall is? Eighteen thousand sixty-eight dollars. Way to go, Mrs. Ritchie. Mm -hmm. We can always rely on you. Eighteen thousand six hundred dollars. Um, so a motion on the table to cut. All in favor? Mrs. McCammon, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Maroney. And the motion does not carry. Um, technology, RC 15, line 13035, software maintenance. There is a proposed change of $109,350 and add to the budget. Is there a second? I'm going to just second so I can talk Mr. about Sini? it. Mr. Sini? Sure. <laughs> um, you can talk about it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to underscore, I think this is a conversation we have to have with all stakeholders. I'm not going to uh, support the motion to add to it, but I think this is an issue that's been hanging around for two to three years and would love to uh, get a formal agenda item in the future to discuss it. Okay. Mr. Burke. Uh, I concur with Mr. Sini to the extent that uh, I think at some point we should have a a full discussion. I know it's come up at different points and with different administrations uh, coming and going. I know some administrations may, uh, may have, might have supported it, some not. But if it, at some point, we should we should look at this and make a value uh, judgment as a board as to whether or not we want to uh, uh, use the software or or not. But I'm not in support, obviously, of uh, putting it in now. Any other comments or questions on this item? Mr. Brown. I would agree with Mr. C that I would like to hear more. I intend to vote for it in this motion, uh, but um, I, I do think if it does fail, I would like to hear more on it. Great. All right, and with that, um, there's a motion to add $109,350 for the express purpose of OpenGov um, to the budget. All in favor? Mr. Brown and Mrs. McCammon, the motion fails. Uh, technology line one two three zero two one new computer equipment. There is a reduction to the budget of sixty five thousand. I so move. Is there a second, Mrs. Ritchie? <laughs> <laughs> um, any conversation on it? We'll give you a chance to write. Is there any conversation? Any conversation on this? Okay. Ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor of the reduction of sixty five thousand to line one two three zero two one. And that is unanimous. Motion carries. Uh, new computer equipment line one two three zero two one. There is a reduction of the budget of two two hundred fourteen thousand five hundred dollars. I so move. Is there a second, Mrs. Ritchie? Um, discussion. Well, I just what I would like to discuss is just I'm not in favor of this cut, and I'm support I fully support the one to one rollout. But I would like to see when these plans come to us that we are very efficient in our planning and we're looking forward and we're looking at enrollment and that we're planning accordingly and that we're not planning too much excess in terms of devices. I just, that's my comment on that. I, Thank I you. Defer for perspective. Thank you. Mrs. McCammon? Um, I, I said it before, but I thank Dr. McGettigan for the presentation. I think it was extremely helpful to understand. There, there has been rampant conversation about whether or not the iPads are used, and so um, I appreciate the opportunity to understand, um, what, you know, what's really going on. Um, and to that end, you know, I, I agree that I, I will not support the cut um, because I think I'd like to support anything I can that's educational, including financial software. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I've said enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Shut it. <laughs> there's a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, Ms. McGinnon, sorry for my curt response and breach of decorum there earlier. My apologies. Uh, I am going to vote against this motion, however. Um, I did not work on a Commodore PET. Was involved <laughs> um, with some mainframe system planning. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you know, three quarters of that work was the planning, uh, implementation, how you're going to measure success. I heard we're banking here on the promise of the iPad three years in, uh, and I cannot support 200 plus thousand dollars on a promise. 
Okay, so there's a motion on the table to cut to uh, $214,500 to line 123021, all in favor? Mr. Brown, and the motion fails. Um, technology, new computer equipment, line 123021. We're still here, folks. Um, there is a reduction to the budget of $19,500 put forward by the administration. I so move. Is there a second? Mrs. Stein seconds. Um, is there any conversation? Everyone feel that? Um, so, all in favor. I, I think I don't understand this. Yes, thing. yes. So, okay. So, so, all right. So, so, is there any conversation? Sorry. So, the, the pans. The pens uh, are in the 214 that you've already sort of sort of approved, right? That's um, right. That's and this is just a price point uh, adjustment that uh, that we got from okay. from okay. prices. So it's a cheaper, cheaper price. Yeah, they're yeah. 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 <laughs> saving money. Thank you. It's a okay. No brainer. So let's let's call for that one again. Uh, a reduction of the budget of nineteen thousand five hundred dollars put forward by the administration to line one two three zero two one. All in favor. And that is unanimous. Motion carries. Um, stay tuned, folks. We are on new computer equipment line one two three zero two one. A reduction to the budget of fifteen thousand dollars by the administration. May I have a second, Mr. Burke. Um, any conversations or questions, Mrs. Yes. Stein? So after the last presentation, and Ms. McGettigan, and you may want to answer. I don't know. Recycling the twelfth grade iPads. Will they have the Logitech capacity for putting them in the hands of our DHS students. No, but, the 12th um, no. Let, let her clarify that. Uh, <clears throat> sorry for the record. Uh, the twelfth grade iPads do not have the capacity to work with the Logitech crayons. The so I, but so I, I, explain the recycling. So explain the recycling then to me. Where are they going? So there are places all around the world that are super excited uh, to purchase right, Got it. Uh, these devices. So. The term in technology, which is confusing, is called recycling. recycling. Thank you. I so we're going that. to recoup some of the cost. Right. I like that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other conversation or discussion? Okay. So all in favor of a reduction to the budget of fifteen thousand for line one two three zero two one, and that is unanimous. The motion carries. Technology, new computer equipment, one, two, three, zero, two, one, a reduction of the budget put forward from the administration of $5,000. May I have a second? Um, Mrs. Stein, any conversation? Seeing none, um, all in favor of reduction of the budget of $5,000, replied one, two, three, zero, two, one. And that is unanimous. The motion carries. Um, we will move on to uh, RC 16 administration line, I'm sorry, line 12001 consultant services. There is an addition to the budget of $25,000 put forward by the administration. May I have a second? Mr. Burke, any comments or? I think I would like to hear what this transportation consultant is going to do. Uh, Madam Chair, may I, may I talk about that in consultation with um, 5201 regular people transportation because it goes together? Um, you can, and though people may have more questions on that line as well. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do it now or do you want to do it? No, I think we, we should keep them yeah, separate. Well, okay. at the moment. Do so hold this guy? Separate? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I'm in favor of this. My only question is can we accelerate it so it can be done sooner? Because I would rather do it sooner than later. So because we haven't had a chance to really discuss this, let's let Dr. Adley introduce it and then we'll get to that question. Dr. Adley, you're on. So I'm going to talk about it holistically together, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so at this point, um, I, I recognize that I'm coming back to the Board of Education, you may say at the 11th hour, um, uh, but based on some discussions I've had, I want to recognize uh, the police chief. Uh, uh, Chief Anderson for a whole his work and collaborating with us, right? Um, but having had a meeting with him uh, in person on Friday, unfortunately that work is still not complete. And it won't be complete for another seven to ten days. Um, so recognizing that the board doesn't have information uh, to go on, that's one, a predicament. Uh, two, honestly, uh, that area is not ideal. I've said that the parents who have met with me, I've said it at the board. It's a difference between safe and ideal. Uh, but I also recognize that uh, in the summer and in the fall, 
you're going to have that area once, once again under construction. And my concern is we're going to be facing this issue again in the fall and we'll just, go right, we'll just be facing the same issue. Uh, given that I don't expect that that area is going to get any safer uh, with construction. It's my best recommendation uh, to, to the board to actually put in a bus for the year, for next year, not for this year because the construction is not happening this year. Um, but for next year, put in, a, put in a bus for the year. You won't have any surprises throughout the year. You use the time and, uh, to do a thorough, because I think the board has indicated they would like to look at the, at the policy and practices of transportation. Uh, we do that in a thoughtful way. Uh, that's why we put in this particular line item, because a consultant of some description is going to be necessary. And if it's not, then it would be, you know, we wouldn't use it if, it, if we didn't need it, but if we think we're going to have to, it's going to be comprehensive. Uh, so it's my best recommendation to address this issue uh, for next year, again, not for this year, and have a thorough review of uh, the transportation policy and practices. And Mr. Burke. Uh, following up on Mr. Moroni's point, so uh, the consultant will be taking uh, a broad-based view of the transportation policy, not just safety, but the the whole aspect. I mean, the parents have talked about safety. They've also talked about um, quality of life a little bit, uh, you know, to use a, a phrase. Uh, just so I understand, we're, we're going to be looking for someone to talk more than just safety, correct? Yes, I mean, the whole routing and the whole way we do busing. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of issues discussed. Do you want buses in the town, even though we don't have ordinances to park them? Do you want? I mean, there, there's all sorts of things that, that you consider. I would just be clarify this is for the Renshaw Town Hall Fitch, north of Post Road area, that whole catchment area. The bus, the bus, not yep. the consultant. The bus, yeah. not the consultant. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions, I particular to the consultant? All right, we're going to have the bus the later, consultant. or if you want to elide them, ask them now, and you'll have another shot later. But at the moment, this is the consultant. Uh, just on the time, uh, sorry. Yeah. Just on the timing of the consultant. Um, so we're approving it for the budget starting July. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think Ms. Ritchie said something about starting this process earlier. Um, you know, I, this is the 11th hour, and, and I, I support the idea wholeheartedly. I even support the idea of potentially adding a bus. I just feel like we haven't been given the information. I mean, you just gave us, you know, uh, a few different streets that it will be covering, but we have no idea what the number of students we're going to be covering. So, I guess my first question is: if we do approve this consultant, when will we be able to commence that study? So, this, the number of students, just for record, is just in excess of 25 students, right? Uh, easily that we that we can tell right away. Um, Technically, I mean, technically, if it's in the budget for next year, technically, we would be we would be starting it in July. Uh, if there's a decision otherwise, then we would have to do a transfer or something else. Or, an I guess, my recommendation would be to address this totally separately at a very soon meeting, and we'd address it as a separate agenda item outside of this budget. This way, we could accelerate the study um, and then discuss the possible options and, and solutions. I realize that would be an out of cycle um, budget request from the Board of Finance. But I feel like it would be showing proper due diligence of this board and of the administration. You know, the administration could show us and we'd have a chance to hear from all the stakeholders here. It goes beyond the police department, planning and zoning department, talking about the buildings. Um, we could talk about the crossing guard issue and whether or not that's a solution. I guess I'll just end by saying I think this is a, a rushed decision. I un understand we have a deadline, but if we could push this forth a week or two from now and address it separately, I think that would be uh, show proper due diligence in process. Mrs. Steiner. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think in the policy it's very clear for exigent circumstances like construction, you can add a bus, and this is a temporary solution. What you're saying, Dr. Adley, is it's a year. That'll give us time to do the full assessment. So I think it sort of solves, in my opinion, solves both problems. You address the needs of the concerns with construction while we're going to go through a thorough, um, you know, study of our transportation. I would just state a point of fact that construction has indeed started in that area. Um, they're starting to dig the uh, drainage holes yeah. and that sort of thing, and will 
commence at a, at a better clip through the spring. So I guess what I'm saying is I think and we can address it. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think we can address it quicker by actually taking this out of this budget cycle and addressing it uh, you know, in, in proper order at, at, an, at a following meeting. Mr. Brown. I would just like to echo Mr. Cini's comments. Um, I think if we do, I think the board should do a thorough evaluation of its policies. I would be comfortable going forward uh, to the town with an off-cycle request. And I think that the idea of adding one additional bus, you know, we may do a full review of our policy. We may have advice with the consultant. We may add three. We may take away three. I don't know. So I, I think it's premature at this point. But uh, I think obviously we have a community need that needs to be addressed, and I think we should do that in a comprehensive framework as a board. Mrs. McCammon. Dr. Adley, the construction, there's a couple construction projects, um, and I, I certainly uh, agree that Neroten Avenue is its own entity. Um, but have we done an evaluation of the points that will be touched by construction? So I've had a Again, I've had a discussion about um, the construction sites uh, with the police chief, um, but I'm just saying to you, it doesn't matter what, what, what I see in that particular area, I'm not going to be convinced until it gets, get happens that, that, it's, that we're not going to have problems with it, in that, particularly that particular area. Um, so I just don't want to leave that to chance. I do have a wee bit more reassurance of, of some of the other ones that are being done in town, um, but that particular area is just as we know, it's bad at the moment, right? Um, yeah, and, and to be just to be clear, yes, it's, it's, commen Sini. it's commenced already, and then we're also talking. There's a third project that's not as well known. That's mm -hmm. at Neroten and West Avenue. So that's a, a lane widening. Uh, that, again, I don't know the timing. That would be part of the discussion. To really, kind of frame the acceleration of work in this area, not only amongst the two development projects, but also. Uh, that, you know, the, the traffic uh, construction. I, I think the board has to sort of look, if I may just make a comment, we have a couple of big heavy lifting things to look at, including athletics and this and so on and so forth. So I think the board would sort of need to look at the, at how to map that out uh, collectively together. I, uh, John, I don't feel the need to like do it right now, um, personally, just and professionally, but I understand why you would say that. Thank Do I see a hand, Mr. Dean? Mr. Dean. I think I would, to the point of the whole conversation, I'd like to understand where does the $25,000 number come from? I mean, everything I hear, it sounds like it'd be a lot bigger project than that to look at, I think, everything we need to look at if we're going to do the right thing. There's been a number of studies done by the folks that are building the Palmers Federated. There's a study done a couple of years ago, a pedestrian study that was done by the town. So there's resources out there. But in order for the consultant to hear what our concerns are, to hear what the public's concerns are, I don't know if $25,000 is enough of a placeholder versus hearing what they can do, listening to what we feel we need done, and then coming up with the proper plan. So I agree with some of Mr. Cini's points, although maybe in a little bit of a different way. Um, I think, I'm sorry, I have something in my eye. Um, I think that we need to be really clear about roles. Um, the police decide the safety of our streets. Right, and, and uh, Chief Anderson um, has assured me that keeping kids safe is, of course, his top priority. And they are trying to do it right, and they are trying to do it well. And I don't think any board member alone wants to make the one decision about whether a route is safe or not, nor do, quite frankly, I think we're equipped to do that. And so um, I agree that kind of working with the groups, the police, P and Z, really understanding all that's going on. I think that there has been a compelling case made looking at the traffic studies that this construction is going to blossom. And um, I know at the OPC table, we've talked with Mr. Olvani, who has been fantastic about you know trying to see about, um, John, you can correct me. I'm gonna use the wrong term, but like moving heavy materials in and out and schedules for doing that. Um, and so I think they're really willing to work with us. I think where we're going to see the most disruption is by the beginning of next school year. I could be wrong. I'm comfortable putting in a consultant to help us look at our policy because I think we're really going to need some help. This policy has been in um, for so long that we're going to have to help get it unengrained if we really want to make some change and know how to do it correctly. 
Um, I would support, and we'll get to it, I would support a bus for next year to give us the space and the time and to get the, the give the, the police and all those bodies involved, P and Z, um, really the space and the time to have a well-developed um, conversation. And quite frankly, the parents have done an amazing job advocating for this and really bringing the concerns to the table. So I think they need to be heard. They need to be respected in that. So I think this plan for me does that. It meets the needs of the children. It gives parents a voice. It gives us time to work with the other town bodies. Um, and it gives us really time to delve into our policy. Mr. Maroney. I, I just would like to have an answer to Duke's question. Are, are we comfortable with the 25,000? That, that gives us a study that we can really sink our teeth into and understand our busing situation. It's, it's sort of typical for what that might be. I don't know if you want to concur with that or not. Or there aren't a lot of companies out there that do this type of work. Uh, but as a ballpark figure, yeah, 20 seconds. Okay. okay. Uh, Mrs. McKenna. Uh, Dr. Adley, you made the point that we've got a lot of major projects as a board, yeah. board administration, and we kind of need to map it out. And I, I think that's sort of the question, is what you're saying, that there is, you don't have the capacity to take on looking at busing until the next fiscal year? Um, I don't think it's like I don't think it's particularly like this is this is the money for it the next fiscal year as long as this topic is done completed dusted and recommendations all in place well in time for budget process for next year it's just a figment of of the act where we're placing the money at the moment so but in terms of the, the idea of, of moving it earlier and, and perhaps having the study done earlier is that is that what either for financial or or time and effort I'm not. I mean, I'm not personally opposed to that, but it depends. Like, I think you need to give it some distance from this. Um, but there's nothing magical about July 1st. It just seems that we could do it from that period comfortably in time for the next budget season. But if the board thought otherwise, then we would have to do it otherwise. How long does what do you would you imagine it would take? Uh, I think, well, you've got committee meetings. You've got research to do. It's going to be a couple of months. It's been three months or so thereabouts. Three months. And, and when do you need it ready for the next budget cycle to start those discussions? Well, I want to, I certainly want a healthy distance uh, between these meetings and, and, and that because it's going to it need to be wrapped up. Um, I'd be like this, I would like this sort of done by no later than November, but October, end of October, or November, just sort of area to so they don't know what we're looking at for the budget. Should we should should it impact the budget? Mr. Burke, I you know I'm sensitive to. Mr. Sini's comments in the sense that this is something that's, uh, as Dr. Adley acknowledges, has come up rather late in the uh, rather late in the game, uh, but it is something that's uh, been well thought out by the uh, parent community, and ultimately, we're going to need that information from a study. So I think whether we say we commit to it now or we commit to it offsite, off cycle. We're going to want that study. We're going to want that information. So I would uh, vote to do it now. Maybe we can find someone who will agree not to get paid till they're done, and then that will. <laughs> 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 okay. I can well, see the board of finance pay them until they get it done. Now, <laughs> Mr. Zagrowski's not going to like that presentation. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Mr. Deneen. I guess my my issue is, and unless I'm hearing people wrong, this putting a bus on for next year, starting a consultant study. But I guess what I've heard, we have a current problem that I'm not sure we're satisfying. And I think there's a current parent request or need to look at what we need to do now. I mean, let's face it, construction has started there. There's bulldozers, Palmer's is cordoned off, Federated has started, there's a big pile of dirt there. So I, I agree with the plan to do a study, put a bus on, a bus on next year, but we almost seem to be skirting the issue of there seems to be a request on the table now to address this from now to the end of this school year. So and, I'm and not sure we're addressing I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little confused Murray. here. Are yeah. we, are we we're, talking we're, about the consultant or are we talking about the bus? Because I, 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 I think, that, I think we're, we should address them separately, and I think we should address the consultant now, and then we go to the bus. I think there's also two right. separate issues. I I'm would fine agree. with and, the, um, It's a good point, Dennis. Oh, the, fair. I'm fine with the consultant. I'm not so fine with the timing of it. I'm fine with the added bus for next year. But what I'm hearing from the community and from the folks is there's an issue right now that they want to address. I totally agree. And I think, honestly, what we have to, what I think 
I appreciate what Mr. Sini says because I'm in full support of going off cycle to the Board of Finance to, to bring this forward. But I think we have to separate out, and I think the one, the one flaw I think in the parents' argument of the busing is I think you're mixing two things. One is policy of two miles, and one is safety. And to me, those are two different elements. And if we rewrite our policy and say two miles is too far, I don't feel comfortable going to the Board of Finance to ask for money because that's on us. If we ask for, if we say that we now feel that this area is unsafe to walk, then to Mr. Denise's point, I think we go tomorrow and say we need a bus tomorrow because it's not unsafe. It's not going to be unsafe as of September 1st. It's un going to be unsafe as of yesterday. So I so think, I think we have to, I think we're, 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 we're struggling with where we're going on this issue. I think part of the problem is, and, and I know Dr. Adley struggled in the 11th hour as we're all struggling with this ad in the 11th hours. We don't have that determination yet. I understand that, but and and, so and which is why I think so, we need this so as we move, survey. So I think consultant. where we have two separate issues is we need to approve a budget tonight. And so do we put money in the budget anticipating a problem, anticipating that we need to meet the needs of, that the parents have brought forward to us knowing we have construction, knowing all these factors. And we've heard a lot from the Board of Finance about we'd like you to be as transparent as possible. And so part of that is we are going to anticipate that this expense is a real expense. So we should budget for it up front so that it is, it is clear to everyone. And quite frankly, these families can plan what their school year is going to look like. There is another question of whether there's an immediate safety issue. That would need to be handled in this budget or by an offset cycle budget appropriation. And once we have a determination on that, we can decide the best way and the most efficient way to approach that. I think, if I understand Dr. Adley, that's why currently we have this imperfect solution of a late bus at Darien High School because there's a desire to work with parents. So I think what we have to do tonight is make the determination of what are we putting in next year's budget. Mrs. Ritchie. Since we're talking about this current year and the situation going on right now, has administration looked at the current fleet of buses and is there any ability to take those 25 students and put them on buses now? Well, what's happening now that they are jumping, forget the term, uh, they're jumping on, on, on the bus in the morning. Um, some of them, some of them have decided not to do that, some have decided to do that. We can't rewrite any more buses to, to accommodate them beyond what we've done. But they're getting on buses somehow, so yeah. is there room for them on those buses currently? And we're not kicking them off those buses, right? Uh, we have asked kids, uh, children to leave the buses, and that's not a, a position I, we want to be in, I don't think. Um, and I can't guarantee we won't have to do that again. I think it probably, did, correct me if I'm wrong, depends on the ridership each day. Right. Right. Well, Mr. Think, Sini, sorry, sir, and then Ms. McKenna. Go, go ahead. I was going to say, to that point, I think particularly if there's a weather event like an early dismissal, I think that's a point in time where it becomes very problematic to not, for kids to not have a way home. Mr. Sini. So I just want to reiterate, my goal is to actually speed this process up, not wait until the next budget cycle for full-time bus. Yeah, you know, we can have that discussion in a more comprehensive manner and also potentially speed up the study so we're not waiting until September, and that's the goal uh, that, that I wish to achieve by having a discussion within a meeting or two. Okay, so I think um, that probably outlines it pretty nicely. At the moment, we have to decide what to put in next year's budget, and then um, in the next meeting or two, we need to synthesize <coughs> current information and next steps from February to June. But at the moment, we need to make a decision on what we are putting in next year's budget. I, just one process question. If we were to put it in uh, next year's budget but then accelerate and ask for an off-cycle appropriation, could we make an adjustment for that? If we were to go to the Board of Finance um, when we present our budget, at times they have been willing to hear us on a suggested modification. At that point, it's in, in their hands, but they have been open um, when we've had to modify <coughs> something based on new information. And we just have to provide them with the information why, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've never found them unreceptive to that. As long as we have the information, I guess. So is, is that a potential plan? Then we, we can, if we are interested, put it in the budget, but have a conversation in the next couple of meetings. And then if we need to alter the plan, 
by speeding things up we can that's that what I would like to see happen I would like to see it happen sooner and if we can do it now that would be great and um, you know if we need to go to the Board of Finance to make that to recommend that adjustment that would be ideal so discussion on moving up the study certainly could happen on the next agenda discussion on safety is is gonna happen once we have the information right so just so just so we know if, mm -hmm. if they're both here for the next agenda they can be on February 25th if it's only one it can be there does that answer everyone's questions for the moment on this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so administration consultant fees, line 12001, um, in addition to the budget of $25,000, um, all in favor. And that is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Motion carries. Um, administration RC 16, line 12004, legal fees, a reduction of the budget of 13000 based on the administration's recommendations. May I have a second? Um, Mr. Burke. Sorry, Mr. Maroney, I'll give oh, you one. Yeah, I keep trying to He's dying. Just let he him is. do it. He is. He's, like, he's oh. been up every time. I just with some um, Any discussion? <laughs> Everyone ready to vote? All in favor? Um, that is Mrs. Stein, Mrs. McCammon, Mr. Burke, Mr. Brown, Mrs. Ritchie, Mrs. Lachman, Mr. Demean, and Mr. Maroney, all opposed? Mr. Sini, and no one's abstaining. Motion carries. Um, <coughs> RC 22 Tech Ed, Tech Ed Teaching Supplies uh, 21305. There is an addition to the budget of $63,116. I will move a second. Mrs. Stein, conversation. Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> um, next time. It's coming here. Start right. looking that way. Um, any conversation? Mrs. McCammon. Um, honestly, what I would prefer is to add something like this over things like uniforms. And so I, I respect, I totally respect difference of opinion. I, but I won't be voting for this because I, I, I think we have other things to prioritize. But I will just speak to why I'm not voting for something that's educational this time. Can you, can you repeat what you, you said originally? My, my well, I, I'm gonna vote no, but my, my preference would be to do something like this over something like uniforms. Understood. But I don't think, given that we have uniforms, that I will move forward. Any other comments or questions? I, I second Mrs. McCammon, but I'm not voting no. I think this is a need and we should vote yes for it because it is educational and uniforms are additional to me I voted no for that but unfortunately that didn't go the way I hoped it would but to me this is something we should have <laughs> yeah, because we're applying <laughs> after the fact on a vote I hear where you guys are I totally hear where you are um, okay any other conversation okay so with that there is um, a motion on the table to approve sixty three thousand one hundred and sixteen dollars to the budget on line two one three zero five tech ed teaching supplies all in favor that is mrs. Stein mr. Brown mrs. Ritchie mr. Deneen and mr. Maroney all opposed um, mr. Sini mrs. McCammon and mr. Burke the motion carries thank you everybody did you vote in favor? I did okay <laughs> yeah um, RC 24 special education 21305 contracted speech there's an addition to the budget of fifty four thousand four hundred dollars as put forward for by the administration I'll move is there a second Mr. Rooney is there a second <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any discussion on this item can, can you just remind us what this was was this part of a, uh, another adjustment or is this yeah this, okay sure. it's, it's a reallocation yeah. just just a line items yeah. thank can, you can we take these three as, as one yeah uh, that's what i was um that's what i was looking at you know what they are different lines contract <laughs> different accounts OT, they're different accounts too and we should take them individually you can have a discussion as they relate to each other but i think we need to take them they're separately. different accounts i think you just covered it for me yeah. Yeah. it's a net zero think, yeah yeah Okay, so any other discussion? So there's an addition to five of fifty-four thousand four hundred dollars to line two one three zero five for contracted speech. All in favor? That is unanimous. Motion carries. Um, there is line two one three one one. I'm sorry, two one three oh nine contracted OT. A reduction to the budget of fifty-one thousand four hundred dollars is put forward by the administration. May I have a second? Mr. Deneen this time. Um, any conversation? 
All right, all in favor? And that is unanimous, the motion carries. Line 21311, contracted, o, uh, contracted PT, a reduction to the budget of $3,000 is put forward by the administration. May I have a second, Mr. Sini? Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries, that is unanimous. Uh, we already covered substitutes. Uh, uh, regular pupil transportation, line 52001. There's an addition of the budget of $88,452 is put forward by the administration. May I have a second? Mrs. Stein, any conversation? Mr. Maroney. So, where, I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions on this. So where, where exactly is this bus going to pick students up from? Is it just in the, the town hall area, or are we going all the way over to Giovanni's and, and that part of town as well? Of course, okay, you can Sorry. go to so, so all the way, all the way to the Stanford, the, Stanford, <laughs> the Stanford line. No, no, no. We're, so, so we're not gonna pick students, so, but the students who have to walk within that two mile distance, So I assume people who live on, say, on the opposite side of the train station, that area, Miles Road, Walmsley Road, do they walk? It depends if they're, if it, it depends what. Uh, so, so those students will not be affected by this right. additional bus. So my question, and this is where I struggle with, is those students have to walk by a construction zone if they're walking to the high school. So how come the ones who walk on Roten Avenue were deeming more at risk than other ones who are not? And I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I will vote, be voting no on this until we get a further study and then again go to the board. Sorry go to the Board of Finance with a full picture to make sure that all our students are safe in the town and not just some because parents are speaking up for it. Any other comments or questions? <coughs> Mrs. Ritchie. So just to be clear then, this bus is, would be, this new bus would be for those 25 students that you referred to either, earlier. Yeah, it may be more, but guess in that ballpark, yes. Can I just clarify something? I sit here today, believe in our students are safe. I just want to be, be sure, like, and I'm, I think you're probably thinking I think that, but I just want to clarify that because I would have a, I would change that right now if that was the case. I would really, but anyway, that to be further discussion. Mr. Maroney. So for me again, I have a question of if if we're adding this bus, why? I have to assume that a one mile radius, again, I don't know this for sure, but again includes Miles and Walmsley Road and, and whatever, Relahan Road to walk to the middle school. So again, those students are walking past a construction site which we're saying is unsafe and is precipitating this need to have a bus. And again, I think this is a bigger plan and a bigger picture than adding one bus. So I feel like we just need to be careful on naming streets. Like Relihan has a bus, or maybe parts of Relihan have a bus, but like we might not all know anecdotally, and I don't want to worry anyone out there if they have a bus or they don't have no, a and, bus. And, and, that, and this is my ignorance of not knowing our bus schedule, but there are, there, are, there are neighborhoods that have to walk by this construction sites. And if we're talking about safety, then every student should have the ability, if, if, if the rationale for putting this bus in sure. is because we're, we're concerned about the temporary safety of the children who have to walk by this, then all children should have access to a bus if we're deeming this area unsafe. That's all I'm saying. Mrs. McCannon. I think Dennis has to the point of having a full conversation in one or two meetings time because I think you're asking good questions. Um, but we're not prepared to answer them, or I don't, I don't think we have all the information yet. We haven't heard the police information is not right, in yet, no. and I, I, think, I think a conversation with uh, P&Z or whoever is relevant just to make sure that we've thought correctly about construction would probably be appropriate as well. Mrs. Ritchie. So again, I, I fully support taking a hard look at transportation and keeping our students safe. And that is why, once again, I'm going to really hope that we can get this transportation consultant study done sooner rather than later because it may not just be one bus, it may be two buses, and if we have to go back to the Board of Finance and ask for more money for student safety, um, I'm happy to be there and, and pinch it if we, you need me to. So I think I'd like to see a comprehensive study done, and I want everything that we need put in place and not just a Band-Aid that's temporary. 
Thanks. Do I see him here, Mr. Burke? Right. I mean, I don't think we're not uh, prepared to say anything is deemed, uh, you know, unsafe. I mean, there's potential when these projects are ongoing, what we think may uh, occur. But uh, I mean, this the safety case, you know, just it hasn't um, it hasn't been made yet to a sufficient you know, standard. But I think that this is a uh, you know a proper uh, you know, measure to support, and we are, we're going to have to look hard at, you know, not so much the safety issues, but I think the compelling points that I've heard, and they somewhat relate to safety, but kids like walking to and from school uh, you know, in the dark, and the amount of time that it takes a kid to walk to the high school from some of these areas, considering the, the uh, the pressures and their academic schedules which go before the first bell and, and well after. So I think it's something that we're really going to have to uh, look at hard from a lot of angles. Uh, and uh, But at this point, I, uh, I'm comfortable with this uh, proposal. Mr. Maroney. Again, for me, I, I take those in two different aspects. Well, again, I, I keep talking about safety and, and I, I agree with Dr. Adley. I, my, I'm not saying it's unsafe. My, my point is just, if we're, if we're talking about adding a bus, for me, the only rationale would be because there is temporarily unsafe areas. I think the discussion about distance <laughs> and having to walk to school in the dark, it becomes a policy issue because that is not only affecting this one neighborhood, it affects all students who would live within a one mile to two mile or whatever we want, a half mile to two mile radius of the school where it's going to take you 50 minutes to walk to school. So that is a much bigger and broader discussion than, than this. So from my view, the only way I can see this being added to the budget tonight is because it's a potential safety issue which we hope to alleviate in the budget for next year. I hope it's not the rationale where it's this is a long walk for students to do because I, I think that's our policy and if, we agree, if, if we're going to revise our policy then we should have done that when it was proposed by two members sitting here twice in, in different meetings and we should have had the policy committee look at it. If we're doing it for potentially averting safety concerns then I think that's a different discussion but again I think it's, I think we have a much broader discussion on that. Just for clarity that, that it's done under the superintendent exemption under uh, safety concerns, yes. So I, I would say um, this, this matter, I think, was brought to the board, and I think there were conversations administratively by December. I, I feel pretty strongly that I'm not entirely sure policy would have been able to handle it by now. Um, I, don't, I think it's way broader, and I actually think um, the consultant is a good idea. I, I also think what we've been asked to do continually is to identify real costs, and I think at a minimum, we know we're looking at adding at least a bus. And, and we're, we're being asked by the town bodies, please identify your costs when you can so that we know what's going on. And so this, really, this line item is identifying that we will have this cost. I think we, personally, I support the idea, and I think the Board of Finance has always been open to if we have to make a modification, um, much like the, um, Mr. Sini was suggesting earlier, that you know we need more we need less but but <coughs> we to to put a zero in or to say we're, we're not going to do anything yet i think is disingenuous going forward both to the taxpayers and to even if we were to come off cycle um i think that the, we have seen compelling evidence that it, we will at least need a bus and so to not do that is not being um as forthright as we can so i will support the addition of this bus mr Sini. Stated my case about accelerating, but proper process is important, and we haven't even seen a bus route. What 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 areas this would cover? I think there's. I see at least two board of finance members here. I think they've been noticed that we're struggling with this. This came to us late in the budget cycle, and we can achieve this in better order and proper order and quicker order if we just push it out to two weeks, uh, two or, or two meetings, so that we can have a comprehensive discussion over this. 
And so I won't be supporting this measure, but I will be pushing hard that we address it in a comprehensive form and communicating with my fellow elected officials that they're going to see this coming down the pipe. So just so I'm clear on the process you're recommending is what's on the decision tonight. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about accelerating a process, maybe off cycle if we need to, but in terms of a budgeting process, what are you recommending? I am not going to vote for this line item given the information, the lack okay. of information that I've received on this line item this evening. Okay. Mr. Brown. Just to follow up from uh, Dennis and, and your point about that policy wouldn't have been able to deal with this. When we actually put this on the agenda, what's the proper scope for the board? I mean, how, how far do we get the executive administrative decision on the bus versus perhaps recasting our policy to consider? I mean, we set policy. I'm not sure how deep we're going to get into setting the bus routes and where that distinction is from our role to the administrations of this issue. So it's just trying to understand <laughs> where, where the line We is. set policies, how those, bus, <clears throat> how those buses run, are the lovely um, superintendent and Mr. Brutals. Right. <laughs> so, I agree with you. So when this it. comes before us as an agenda and we're looking at our scope, uh, the scope or the actual policy we have, <coughs> that's the scope of our discussion as an agenda that's item and perhaps as revision to the policy. Is that correct or do we get more involved? Yes, no, we would, we would be looking at are we revising our policy. So we got to run concurrently, thank you. Mr. Burke. I, I agree with our chair's point to the extent that, I mean, if we were to have a policy meeting tomorrow, if we were to call for one, the conversation wouldn't be different, really, or more informed than what we're saying right now. So I, I think that, you know, should this you know, board charge the policy committee to then, like, review that, after, you know, you know, after we understand what the <clears throat> consultant may have to say, after we understand, after we've scored it and we know exactly what kind of, uh, you know, money we're uh, talking about, then the policy committee can have a, uh, a full review. We warn that com community members can come back, can come back in and, and have their uh, say. But I just, I don't think if the policy committee right now would be any more <coughs> important. I think we need more information to make a, uh, uh, a good uh, judgment on, on this. Any other comment? Mr. Murray. Yeah, sorry, I, I know I'm beating this horse, but Dr. Adley, do you believe it's in our best, in, if, we're, if we're adding, again, you're adding this bus because you think there was a, there's temporary measures which, which necessit sorry, necessitate a bus for this area because of the construction. I struggle with why we're not going to the Board of Finance now to request a bus for today, for Monday. I, I don't believe, it, but I might, some of my uh, community members might disagree with me, I don't believe we need a bus uh, for there for, for Monday. Um, and I, I still would like to hear from the police department. They, they might change my mind. Like I'll, I'll just reserve the right for that. That's so maybe Tuesday. That's, <laughs> that's the purpose of why we're having that. Um, but in absence of that, uh, I, I don't think we need a, a bus for, mo for Monday, or else I'd be here saying, give me a bus for Monday. Yeah, it, it, real quick, uh, I'm just waiting for that information. I think we can assemble a lot of information in terms of truck routes and a you know, quick call down to the uh, planning and zoning office, get some layout. I think we can be much more informed within two weeks than we are right now. And, and again, I, Dr. Adler, I totally respect the, uh, the, the recommendation. I just need a little more to buy into this. And then again, I want, I want to accelerate it potentially. So that's where I'm coming from. Any other comments on this, on Mrs. McKenna? Just a, just a question again, procedurally. Um, you know, if, if we, I'd like to, there, there are things I would like to understand as well. I'd like to understand the timeline for construction. I'd like to understand the geographic scope, things like that. Um, I also appreciate we're under pressure from this timeline. Um, I don't want to agree to a bus and then find out that there's three different places and now we have to do more. And so I'm just wondering if we're ready, if we really have what we need so that we can make the best decision. And that, that's my hesitation. Uh, we've opened a door. Are we ready for what that means? Okay. I, I cannot, just for the record, I cannot guarantee, because this is level of exposure that you, that in doing this that I expose the board to, that some other residents don't come to the table. Right. 
but again, this is done under the exception for this. But none, none of the rest of them has been brought to my attention at this level, right? And don't forget, parents do have the right to go through a due process here, should they? Uh, so all those those options still still exist for people. Um, anyway, I'm being redundant. We did it. Okay. So, what, sorry. Uh, Mrs. McKenna. Can we? So can we just clarify then what we're expecting to see in at the next? Just so that we're all on the same page, what information are we getting when we talk about busing next time? So that. Well, uh, I'm going to have to think about that very carefully because I'm going to need a consultant to actually do the work, right? <laughs> um, you're going to need to. You're, you're going to need to to call. I'm assuming we're going to call a, a policy committee to look at this. Um, so, so it's a good question, Jill. I'd like. I mean, be very clear of what you're expecting me to bring back here. It's but we're, in the immediate term, and over the next two weeks, we should be hearing from the Darien Police Department. That's correct. And being given their assessment, and that will come that to is us correct. at our next board meeting. So what we, what we might be able to have available, I think, readily, is hopefully the police will come back with a determination. Their determination will de determine safety. We also, and I think all board members received the um, construction packets as approved by P&Z for current um, you know, policy and planning, I cannot think of the right word of traffic flow and the traffic studies for the projects, thank you. I think we probably could talk to P&Z and see if they have anything else. I know um, Mrs. Stevens and I both have asked and Mr. Olvain has been super receptive at OPC, kind of like what information can we gather for pedestrians in general? So I do think we could get P&Z information and I think you could probably have safety and security. But I do not think quite frankly, and, and not to disagree with Superintendent, I, I am unlikely that a consultant is going to be able to provide us information in two weeks. Yeah. And I, I think it's unlikely that policy is going to have a significant recommendation because this is being made under the superintendent's ability to make an exception rather than our issues of state guidelines. And that's going to take far more flushing out. I think that's what we'll have available in the next meeting cycle. Anybody else? Because we do have to vote on this, <laughs> this line. I just want to clarify my vote. I, I will be voting down this, but it's not because I am not for the safety of the students who live in that neighborhood. My vote is to Mr. Sini, I think similar to John's point, is that I think there's a bigger picture here, and we need to look at the bigger picture. And I, I don't, I, I understand your point, Madam Chair, that we need to signal to the Board of Finance. I think we have signaled. I think having a discussion probably for 30 minutes, wherever we've gone on about this, has been a signal enough that this is an important issue. And to put a, a number in that we're, we're, we're just ballparking what, what number we think we do, I think is disingenuous for that. I think we need to come back with, re I'm sorry, I need to get, but I do. I don't think it's the right number. Okay, so it, let me, it's a just let me clarify my point. I'm not ballparking. What I'm hearing is our superintendent is saying he's going to make an exception for this area at $88,000. So to, to pretend that he is not going to make an exception for $88,000 and we're not going to see it in the budget is not a ballpark. Yep. He is saying under his purview there is an $88,000 exception, so we might as well put it in the budget because we know he's going to do it. And he has the authority to do it. Mr. Deneen. But I guess it's all a good discussion. The disconnect continues to be for me. We're talking about there's a safety issue as of September 1st when the bus routes start again now, but you don't see a safety issue between now and the end of the school year. I think it's a hazardous condition issue. So I get, I, I, honestly, what, what, yeah. I mean, again, it's not ideal. Uh, the recommendation is made in an abundance of caution and also to give the board, let's be realistic, some time to look at this in a thoughtful way, right? So it buys a, a wee bit of distance and, and being reasonable, trying to be reasonable about it. Um, if, the if the police come back or there's other information that comes to say that, that's, that the route right now is not safe and we have to address that, then I will be coming back again. So with that, because I feel like at this point I might just go round and round, but does everyone feel that they're heard? Okay, so with that, there is an addition proposed to the budget of $88,452 of line 52001, regular pupil transportation. Um, all in favor? That is Mrs. Stein, Mr. Burke, Mr. Brown, and myself. That is four. The motion fails. Um, workers' compensation uh, fixed, uh, RC25, fixed uh, 
this week. Okay. Just, 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 just 82002, workers' compensation, a reduction to the budget of $17,147 made by the administration. May I have a second? Mr. Brown. Superintendent Adley, do you want to fill us in on uh, this one? It's just, it's just uh, news this week. It's just um, it's a premium rate just for the current. Month. So straightforward. You have more news like that? <laughs> uh, any conversation? All in favor? That is unanimous. The motion carries. Um, Line 82003, health insurance, a reduction to the budget of $94,619. Although, wait a minute, just for fun, Mr. Rudel, give us the number of where we are before we do this one. I should have asked halfway through. Without this? No, yeah, before this uh, one. We're at 3.49 or Okay, so health insurance, 82003, there's a reduction to the budget of $94,619 as proposed by the administration's, may I have a second? Mr. Maroney, um, any discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous. Nice, nice work on that one. <laughs> yep. And so, so just the capital. Oh, okay, yeah. I did, someone had asked about it and yeah. got the information. We got to do capital too. Excuse me, my other sheet got cut off on this one. The only one that's really brought up is the tennis. Yeah, the only one that's up is um, there was a motion to increase capital projects by five hundred fifty thousand for an addition of two tennis courts at DHS. At DHS, do I have a second, second. Mrs. Stein? Any conversation? I'd love to hear because we had asked for the administration's yes. recommendation on that. Yeah, we actually uh, we, don't, we didn't show the questions. Actually, could someone just pull those up, please? Mr. Lynch has been sitting here patiently. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so there you have it. Mr. Lynch, you invited to talk to it. Yeah, Mr. Lynch, you want to You'd talk about tennis kind courts? To sit there already. <laughs> you do it well. Come on. Well, the, uh, the the courts we would we would be looking to use the same engineer that's worked at the high school site since uh, the building was developed back in 2003 and 4. He's done all the field work on on the field renovations, uh, the track. Etc. He did all the engineering work on the new high school. Um, <coughs> so I spoke to him. I spoke to the uh, the contractor that's on the uh, the state consortium for, for expanding the tra the uh, the courts from five to seven. And um, you know he, he he gave me a time of when it would uh, work. And then uh, since I proposed this, uh, Pam Gary <coughs> from the uh, Recreation and Parks Department called and they're going to be doing some work on Weed Beach on those tennis courts So we're going to try to work together with the town You guys always ask about if we ever do that to let you know so I'm letting you know there's a good chance we could do that um, and uh, th There does appear to be room on the property over uh, on the uh, north west corner uh, without interfering with the the new uh, cross country track. And by going from five to seven courts, what that allows the high school team to do is two things. One is it shortens the time they spend in practice and especially at matches, but it also allows them uh, to host. Because I guess I, I received an email from uh, some parents and um, they said that, you know, it's sports practice and it's two and a half, three hours between the first kids getting on the courts and the last kids getting off, which is an awful long time. It's right about as long as I've spent my whole life in sports practice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they, they, have, uh, they have an ability also, if they have seven courts, that they can host an FCAC and, and state matches, uh, which we don't have the ability to do now. So. Any comments or questions? Mr. Brown. Doctor, was it when we had the athletic or director 
um, Mr. Manfredonio here. He said this was not a necessity for him or this was a nice to have. I'm trying to well, recall. It, was, if it, it wasn't asked for originally, so. Okay. No, it, it wasn't asked for. Um, it, from, from his point of view and my point of view, it was the rebuilding of the five that, that was the necessity. Mr. Maroney. And for me, I think, uh, well, I guess, I, I think the, the, the impetus of this was that if, while we're redoing the five courts, was maybe we could potentially save money by doing the additional two. If you're telling me that this delays the project for another year, it doesn't seem like we're, we're achieving anything by trying to do that. So I think, for me, I will be voting this down to because I think we go forward with the addition, the resurfacing of the current five. I could address that. Um, the, the, the process of making these courts over with this post-tensioned concrete, um, it's, it's weather dependent. So the contractor's already backed up in his schedule. So by the time we start working on these courts and get them finished, you know, when we're finished with the reconstruction of the courts, we should be finishing up with our engineering and our approvals uh, because we can actually start the process of getting two courts approved for construction before we're going to start the process for rebuilding because there's really one vendor that does this and he is right now he's booked through the middle of September. Mrs. Ritchie. So just to clarify, you're saying that you could go through the process of getting the approvals that you need to add the two courts and still basically stay on target to finish it by spring. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the target would be to finish, we'll, we're, the target's to finish the five by spring. The other two being constructed would probably take a little longer. They probably wouldn't be available for the season, but they might be available for, you know, like tournaments at the end of 2021. Okay. Mr. Maroney. I think then that begs the question for me is what would we save by trying to get this done as quickly as possible or if we went and added two courts in fiscal year 2022, would that be double the cost of what this will be additionally or I mean, I don't know the question, I don't know. Well, the cost increase for that would be that the, uh, the, the vendor would have to uh, muster up and, and start again. Um, which means all new insurance, a new, a, maybe a new foreman on the site, et cetera, et cetera, um, a new crew working. Um, so there's that, plus there's the fact that if we can find our way to work with the town, if the timing works out, um, you know, we can have the same vendor here with their A team for a longer period of time. It'll work out better for us. I, can you remind me where this request came from? I. I I know we, we've kind of heard for the additional, about it. The additional two courts being added. Yeah. Um, some of the tennis parents had spoken to Chris, and uh, he and I had spoken about it, and um, I didn't put it in. You know, he asked me if I was going to put it in, and I said, no, my request now is we have to have the five done. And, and then, you know, we were asked again, and we were asked here at these meetings, so. You know, yeah. you, you can't be tone deaf. And then I raised it. In <laughs> no, the no, I, I guess I'm, I, I, what I'm struggling with, and I'll tell you, I, I love it. I, the, I'm trying to understand what we're achieving by it, and I think that I, I just don't know that we've had a fully flushed out conversation about that. And if what it is is, um, like, with, with the running path, we wanted the runners to be able to have FCAC championships. If what we're saying is we want all sports to have FCAC championships, then I would rather <coughs> almost see us plan around that, stage that planning, and understand it. I, this is one where I would agree. I feel like we're getting a little ad hoc. Um, I think those courts desperately are in need of refinishing, so I'm 100% supportive of that. But before we put in new courts, I kind of need to understand our goals for teams. And I think it was in, con in the context, as I raised it, of accelerating certain capital projects because we are going to be heavy on capital projects in the future. And this came up as, you know, something that it had been discussed. Moved. Yes. Yeah. So that that was the context. Mr. Sini? May we call the question? Sure. Do we have to vote on that? Yeah. 
Um, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Yeah. Take, it Take it away. Take it away. You didn't say that. Well, he we kind of did, so can we vote to call the question? I revoke my call. Huh? Can we? All right. Yeah, no, can we vote to call the question? All in favor? I'm on fine. Oh, oh, wait. Well, okay. yeah, that means we're going to Just raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm opposed um, to calling the question. You're opposed to it? I don't believe in calling the question. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> Mr. Rooney is opposed. Did what everyone say to yes to the call of conversation? <laughs> okay, so there is a motion on the table for an additional $550,000 $550, to the capital budget. Um, all in favor? Mrs. Ritchie and Mrs. Stein, the motion fails. Thank you. Now, Here's what happens. You give us the total because we actually have to vote on the budget. Okay. So I need operating and capital. Okay. So we'll start with the operating budget. So there was uh, cuts totaling $62,010. So the revised budget is $103,521,534, which represents a 3.40% increase. 3.40? Okay, Wait, what do we have to vote on? We have to vote on. Amount. The dollar wow. amount. Can you the repeat budget. the dollar? Read the, read the dollar amount. One hundred three million five hundred twenty-one thousand five hundred thirty-four dollars. Okay. And you can do the percentage too. Yeah. Three point so, three point four zero. Um, all in favor of? Um, Wait. Does someone have to second it? Well, it's oh, yeah. Minute. Second. Mr. Cini second. So, <laughs> I didn't really even move it yet. I was getting there. <laughs> um. Okay. So. All in favor of um, the Board of Education's budget of $103,521,539, representing a 3.4% um, increase over last year. Please raise your hand. All in favor. And that is unanimous with eight members voting. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your Thank hard you work to the board. Thank oh, you. capital. You did it inclusive. Capital. Capital. Yep. Um, so the priority one projects uh, stay at one million three hundred eighty thousand eight hundred sixty-eight dollars. One million three hundred and eighty thousand eight sixty-eight. All right. So may I have a motion to approve the capital budget of one million three hundred eighty thousand eight hundred sixty-eight dollars? Mr. Burke, so move. Seconds. All in favor. And that is unanimous. Thank you, everyone, for approving this year's capital budget. We're not done. Don't worry, everybody. I need that. I need that number for me. Yep, I'll get it. Um, we'll move on to action items and personnel items. Mrs. Sion, any PR this week? Thank you. Any public comment this evening? You can't have sat here all night and have nothing to say, really? All right. We love you. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Moroni. Mr. Burke, all in favor? Thank you.